is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. Why are we upset if we're creating jobs? Inflation is still a thing out there for the everyday consumer. With Lisa Mateo on markets. The economic calendar jam-packed today. And Michael Barr with news. Tensions between the U.S. and China have heated up even more. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. We survived yesterday. Good morning, everyone. Tom Keen, Paul Sweeney, Lisa Mateo, and Michael Barr yesterday yep. was absolutely phenomenal with that news flow. That was a news-heavy day, as they say. He'll be covering Roaring Kitty or Hello Kitty, whatever it is, uh, today on GameStop. Sweeney's barely recovering her after the amount he threw into the lodge at Vail this winter, <laughs> and they couldn't get it done. But it's jobs day. I think I was advised by our vast management team it's almost a normal friday it is i think it might be but i mean again this it's change in non-farm payrolls consensus is one hundred eighty thousand. tom kind of uh, you know kind of in line with what we've seen over the past what if it's above everybody's i don't know gloom and doom and what if we get like 220 or yeah exactly i mean the unemployment rate is forecast to be 3.9 percent that seems yeah. Man, it's about as good as you can get. I well, think. we say good morning. We survived yesterday. Rest hand and rested. Paul Sweeney's at least hand and rested. <laughs> I'm not. But uh, good morning to all of you with Jobs Day coming up. Lots going on. A great lineup of people. Some of our regulars and some new Tiffany Wilding, a regular in the 9 o'clock hour. Lindsay Piegza with that huge higher interest rate call yep. on the Fed. Good to get an update on that. And moment, Cam Dawson, on your need to go along the market. Uh, Right here. We're on YouTube, so so is Roaring Kitty. Yeah, I know. That's what I hear. going to push us right off today. <laughs> YouTube, subscribe to Bloomberg Podcast. Search Bloomberg Podcast. Podcast. I can talk. And, of course, uh, on your commute, Apple CarPlay is one way to get it uh, done. We're in the Interactive Broker Studios right now. With your Bloomberg Business Flash, Lisa Mateo. Good morning. Yeah, we have futures. Well, little change right now on this jobs day. You said it, it comes out at 8.30 Wall Street time. Expected to show employers boosted payrolls by 180,000 last month. Slightly more than April, with the unemployment rate seen holding steady. We'll head over to the bond market now. The two-year yield, 4.73%. That's little change. And the yield on the 10-year, 4.29%. And that is little change. Commodities. We'll head over to oil. Prices headed for their third straight gain. Right now, we have Brent crude $80 a barrel, WTI crude $75 a barrel. And taking a look at spot gold, lower at 2,331 an ounce. Moving the markets, you touched upon it. Let's go to GameStop. Those shares were up about 20% not too long ago. Now they're up 1%. That's what they got. Uh, Keith Gill, Roaring Kitty, expected to give the live stream today. Uh, meanwhile, the company reported first quarter net loss year to year, less than expected. Q1 net sales missed estimates. It also said it may sell up to 75 million shares of Class A stock. We'll head over to Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing. They're up two tenths right now. Uh, May sales rose 30% thanks to strong demand for AI, also a recovery in some of its consumer electronics. And TSMC, big because they provide those semiconductors to NVIDIA, Apple, advanced micro devices. Then we'll have it over to Lyft. They kicked off their first investor day yesterday. Said it's expecting 15% growth in bookings over the next three years. Their shares up more than 3%. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash, Tom and Paul. Lisa, thanks so much. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. One note, the president meeting with the leader Zelensky of Ukraine. They're uh, Paul, right down the street from our office, Rue Scribe in Paris. Yep. Carolyn Cohn and I here went over to Paris Baguette to get them a petit okay, dejeuner. Okay, very good. All right. to, Excellent. You know, get them full the service. Room. We welcome Cam Dawson uh, with us right now with uh, New Edge on this stock market. Into the weekend, are you enthused? Can you acquire shares on this Friday? Well, I think that you have to respect <clears throat> the amount of momentum that continues in this market and that the trend is still very much up. That doesn't mean you can ignore things like valuations being stretched, mm -hmm. sentiment being stretched, positioning being stretched, all things that suggest that most people are pretty much all in. However, again, it's respecting the trend in the near term and not sitting on the sidelines as that trend continues yep. to drift higher. But the reality is, I mean, we're still in a world where some of these big tech names, whether it's in NVIDIA or others, are really driving this market. And I saw in your notes something really cool. Only 50% of the S&P 500 <clears throat> is above its 50-day moving average. So, I mean, the breadth 
is still isn't where we'd like to see it, is it? So much for that broadening out trade. It simply has not materialized. Mm. And we saw it for a second and then it evaporated. Yep. So 50% of names above their 50 day moving average, you saw the equal weight S&P 500 hitting new relative low this week. The average stock cannot keep pace with the mega caps. You've also seen a <clears> big <throat> deterioration in the relative performance of those broadening out darlings. So your industrials, your energy, materials, financials, all places that have given up their year-to-date outperformance. This suggests it's still an incredibly narrow market. Well, we're seeing the narrowness. I am seeing, I guess on an annualized basis, breadth in an S&P lift. Can you predict, I guess in a second or third leg of a bull market, uh, an expansion to some form of breadth? Well, like I, double digit return? I don't know if, if I'm predicting it, but I will argue that the market is already predicting it. Because if you look at earnings estimates for 2025, what they have is a big deceleration in those MAG7 names and a huge reacceleration in the everything else part of the market. Okay. And the earnings estimates are pretty high. They're $277 a share for next year. So to your point, Tom, I think we have to see breadth in order to justify where those earnings estimates and thus valuations are. I mean, it's a signal of a healthy market, not a hell of a... What do you think of Roaring Kitty? I mean, <laughs> do, do you look at this as malfeasance of some type, or is it just something brand new for Gary Gensler to think about? I don't know if I like the stock, but I know I like the cats. If I think about why we're seeing this kind of market behavior, it is a reflection of risk appetite and liquidity. And I don't know how much more to read into it other than to say there is plenty of liquidity sloshing around and there is plenty of appetite for people to put risk assets to work, which is why you're seeing things like GameStop as well as, as other speculative type of exactly. companies Exactly. It's well. just a new speculation. They yeah. got a laptop, yep. and they're trading 47 times a minute through Robinhood, right? Yep. I mean, it's a generalization. It, it feels like it. I mean, it feels just like one of those little pieces of the market that just gets kind of get, gets away from you. You, I, you know, you don't worry about it too much. We'll see if they can actually issue some stock, Tom, 75 you know, million shares and where, where the market really is for that. Okay, so what are we going to get from our Federal Reserve next week? What are you looking for from our Federal Reserve? I think the expectations are kind of low. We're not going to get a whole lot. Yeah, we certainly won't get a cut next week. That's not being priced in at all. I think watch the dot plot. That's where we will likely Ooh, see... Oh, dots go. Dots go on the Bloomberg terminal. Dots go. Yep. <laughs> where we see a revision from the three cuts at the median to likely two cuts at the median. Big whoop, but I okay. think it's, it leans likely hawkish. Into the weekend, we're in, in this wonderful seminar I did yesterday uh, with um, uh, Dara Meyer, Alan Ruskin, and Company of Invesco. In the seminar, everybody agreed we're still in the range on interest rates. If we break down, so we have a moldy jobs number today, whatever. If the 10-year real yield breaks down, the Sweeney two-year yield breaks down, if they break down, what do stocks do? I think that bonds will rally because yields will Price fall. Price up, yield down. Initially, stocks might rally, but I think the challenge is that if we look then out a month from now and we start pricing in a much weaker jobs market, a deteriorating growth environment, that challenges where GDP growth and earnings growth is. So maybe your initial reaction is a rally, but I think that those growth revisions would actually cause it to be a <laughs> Paul, weaker should, response. Should we ask her about Paramount? Oh my goodness! Please don't. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> so where where are you looking today? Where what's some of the whether it's equities, fixed income? Where do you see the best relative value these days? Yeah, we're still finding opportunity within the equity market, and we're starting to look into those areas like value, international, and mid cap, but incredibly selectively. We don't think you can index those areas. There are lots of very weak companies, poor balance sheet companies. So if you can be an active manager finding high quality right. companies in those spaces, valuations are still not so stretched right. where you're taking on too much valuation risk like you are in growth. Here's a headline. I missed this yesterday, Paul. Paramount's rival bidders include Patron Tequila oh, Billionaire. It's almost getting That's to the point. a real headline in the Bloomberg. It's Party almost on. getting to the point being embarrassing that this is what we're talking about. Should we break Paramount. out the Patron for you know, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Before we get to Lisa's newspapers. Yeah, I don't know. It, it, we'll, we'll see how this Kev goes. Kev Dawson, thank you so much for getting us started uh, this morning. It is Jobs Day, and we'll give you that data here uh, in about an hour and a half. With our news in New York City, Michael Barr. Thank you very much, Tom. Paul, Lisa, President Joe Biden met with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky in Paris 
as Kyiv's army endures its hardest days of fighting since the early weeks of the Russian invasion and prepares for what officials say could be a tough summer ahead. The United States is Kyiv's biggest supplier of wartime support as Ukraine tries to fend off an intense Russian offensive in eastern areas of the country. Meanwhile, former President Trump has called President Biden's executive order on the southern border, among other things, meaningless. ABC's David Muir asked Biden about Trump's criticisms. He says we have a debate coming up. Biden's executive order is weak and pathetic. Is he describing himself? Today, President Biden continues to mark 80 years since the D-Day invasion during World War II. Biden will visit the 100-foot cliff scaled by U.S. soldiers in Normandy. Former Trump White House aide Steve Bannon has been ordered to turn himself into a federal prison starting July 1st. Bannon refused to comply with a subpoena issued by the House January 6th committee. The former White House aide was convicted of contempt of Congress and sentenced to four months in prison. Outside the courthouse, Bannon claimed this is a part of a long-running attempt by the Justice Department to shut down the far right. All of this is about one thing. This is about shutting down the MAGA movement, shutting down grassroots conservatives, shutting down President Trump. A three-judge appellate panel last month rejected an earlier ruling from the judge who presided over Bannon's case and said that he could stay out while his appeal was pending. It's a big night for fans of daytime television. It is the 51st Daytime Emmy Award Show. Three-time Emmy winner and current nominee Scott Clifton, who plays Liam Spencer on The Bold and the Beautiful, says it's a special year. This one's really cool because uh, it's not just me on our show nominated. There's three of us in, in the same category. It's, my, it's myself and Thorsten Kay and John McCook. The show will be aired on CBS Tonight. Global News, 24 hours a day and whenever you want it. With Bloomberg News Now, I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. Tom, Paul, Lisa. Mike, Michael Barr, we were raving about you. You are out lecturing interns and we were raving about your work yesterday. The news flow has been so crazy. Paul, I haven't even mentioned the NBA. Yeah. And when I look at those numbers, doesn't the salary structure have to completely change? Well, I mean, I, I've always, I've recently thought, you know, these, I can't believe these broadcast and cable networks can keep paying uh, these rights fees, which in fact would put the pay structure of a lot of these leagues at risk. But what happens? The tech companies come in, Amazon comes in, and, and you know, you're going to start seeing more of these technology companies with bottomless pockets coming in, sending these rights ever higher do, yet again. Do you again. assume, and Michael Barr, do you assume that, that the players get their piece of the action? Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, like 15 million is 25 million, the new 15 million. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yes. I mean, if you don't have a salary cap, um, mm -hmm. then there is no uh, ceiling because these rights fees continue to go higher. And as we've known, the, you know, the real economics of these leagues is driven by um, yeah. broadcast rights. Right. So. And I'm not up to speed of this, but you need to see Charles Barkley go over to whatever the new wow. news, right? Yeah. How much is he going to get paid to go wherever the new uh, place is? But TNT has been the home of the NBA for, you know, 30 years and uh, that... You know, where's that going to go if Warner Brothers Discovery doesn't keep the rights? And uh, that could be a real issue for a lot of folks. But uh, rights fees, I guess the simple right. math is they always go up and the value of these franchises always goes up. <clears throat> Remembrances at D-Day continue today. We'll have much less for you. The schedule is of uh, preparation for a state dinner in Paris. I believe that's tomorrow. Uh, but we'll continue to keep an eye on what President Biden is doing in Paris. Is it, There's no space launch today, right? Not that I know of. <laughs> Did you notice know after we oh, left, Jesus. it was a success? It was. It was. And the, uh, I, I, I literally have goosebumps right yeah, now. It's amazing. It's just amazing. Some of the new technology. Keith Cowing, thank you so much yep. for uh, being with us with NASA Watch yesterday. From New York City, Bloomberg Surveillance.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. In the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Futures, little change as traders wait to see if U.S. jobs add a lock in those bets on interest rate cuts by the Fed in the coming months. And what follows policy easing from the easing from the ECB, also Bank of Canada, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, they're still predicting that the Fed will ease next month. We'll head over to the bond market. The two-year yield, 4.73%, little changed. The yield on the 10-year, 4.29%, and that is little change. Few companies making news. We'll start with Tesla. They're down about two-tenths of a percent. An investor sued to challenge a proxy vote over whether the company should move its corporate home to Texas and also reapprove a $56 billion pay package for Elon Musk. Then you have Samsung Electronics, its largest union, went on strike for the first time. That was overpay. The plan to resume normal work hours next week. And finally, the executive departure at Stellantis, down about 1%. The former head of Jeep Ram Brands, Jim Morrison, he's left the company. This is that the automaker deals with a lot of swelling inventories, also slightly sales over in North America. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Uh, thanks so much, Karen. Greatly appreciate it. Paul, can you imagine growing up in Austin, Texas? I mean, yeah. you're 14 years old. Cool you've got happy. your fake ID. Sure. And you're sneaking in to see a sleep at the wheel. Yep. You know, I mean, that's what you do in Austin when you're 14. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We did. Did you read my biography? <laughs> 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 Joining us now from Austin, Texas is uh, Morgan Stanley's Ellen Zettner. And Paul, you led the show with this is on a confusing jobs day. I'm yeah. as confused as you are. So, I mean, Ellen, we're going to get a jobs number today. Uh, how, what is, how does the Fed think about the labor market here? I mean, the labor market seems about as good as it can get. I know we're concerned about the consumer and certain areas of consumer spending, but the labor market, is it as strong as it appears? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do think it's as strong as it appears. Look, we have a lot of labor supply out there. And we should be creating a lot of jobs. And I think that's a realization uh, that the Fed has come to over time, and we've come to over time as we've got new population estimates, new labor force growth estimates. Whereas the Fed was concerned that the labor market was on fire, jobs were on fire, low unemployment rate, really tight labor market, we've learned that it's not so tight. It's actually much better balanced, even though we're creating a lot of jobs. And so I think they've set jobs aside for the moment um, especially mid-slowing wage gains in, as, as in terms of being concerned that it might be a tight spot in the economy. So if we do get a you know, kind of inline kind of jobs number today, something that we've seen over the last several months, how does the Fed look at that, do you think? I think that's great. That's fine. And they'll sit on the sidelines? Yeah. Is that kind of the... Yeah, they'll sit yeah. on the sidelines okay. and market participants will say, okay, fine. Okay. We've gotten past that. Let's look to CPI next week. <clears throat> right. Okay. You get your bulletproof vest on. You're going into a, a cross-asset meeting at Morgan Stanley. Andrew Sheets is hyperbolic in London. Mike Wilson's <laughs> doing what he's doing. You're telling me a 220 statistic. You're telling me a better than good private report. But the bond market is showing at the bottom of a range on yield that I'm sorry, this is a tipping point. You're saying in one hour and 15 minutes, it's not a tipping point, right? No, I don't think it's a tipping point, but I think that the, the so, so here's, the, this is funny. Do you guys talk about the whisper number? Yeah. Sure. What is the whisper number? What do you think it is? I, don't know. I, I never ask. I, I don't play the game, <laughs> but there why, is a whisper do number. Do you know why it's called a whisper number? Yes. Because someone whispered it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but is, someone it, is, whispered it, it. is it sub 150? Yeah. The whisper number, I think, is talking with, with uh, uh, clients, talking with our trading desk, yeah. somewhere around maybe 120, 130. 20, exactly. Yeah. And you're, you're going completely against that. We're going against that. Why? Because we don't see <clears throat> that uh, earnings transcripts show that uh, companies have not slowed their hiring tremendously. Um, we're not seeing a lot of weakness in other labor market indicators compared with prior months. Um, we do see that there are going to be some areas we think of strength. I think the difference of opinion when I talk with others that other forecasters I really truly respect on the labor market that do have something on the order of say 170. Um, it's more of that they uh, believe that the positive weather, pay weather that we had boosting payrolls earlier this year that there's still some payback there. And there is some concern which I do think is legitimate that you get some slowing in business services. Uh, when maybe that's home field advantage because we sit here in business services mm -hmm. uh, in New York, but some concerns that there would be some slowing there. Um, but I don't think that, that, look, I think 150, right? 150 to 200, it's nothing much has changed. Job gains are fine. Mm -hmm. 
con should support the consumer fine. I think you get lower than 150. It's going to build on this this tone from investors that has just begun to roll of is the economy really as strong as we think? And it's really snapped too. And just like the last week to week and a half in my conversations, and now everybody's like, ooh, maybe the economy is not as strong as we think. Maybe it's a lot weaker. And so now we're looking for any of the weak data to confirm that. And so I think below 150, you'll have the market take that and run a little bit with that, maybe price in some more risk of a July cut. And then what if you get below 150 payrolls and you get a downside <coughs> surprise on CPI next week? Even though it's it's during the meeting itself, right? That can change the tone of Chair Powell's. Oh, no, come the on, we're going to make some news on a Friday. Are you suggesting, yeah. given that scenario, not your prediction that we could see a, a Fed adjustment for the meeting? next week? I think that, that it can affect the tone. And I think that it would affect investor positions, right. affect uh, investor positions <clears throat> that are assuming, hey, maybe July uh, is a greater chance than we think. I don't know if you're writing about this this weekend, but to me, the great thrust is the ECB cut yesterday, mm -hmm. but did not establish a Greenspanian measured, which is religion in America. Can we cut in America and not identify a measured trend? Yeah, I think that's exactly what Powell would want to do, full flexibility. And Bank of Canada did it as well. Yeah. Bank of a Canada Bank of Canada well, didn't give an indication deal. of how slow right. or how fast. Lenoy Dujon on my <clears throat> team covers Canada. I mean, we were patting him on the back and said, great for you, Canada's yeah. in the news today, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when they were the first to cut. In, in honor of the wonderful Ken Pruitt, we've got a Segui here. Now, in June, you got to go to Great Slave Lake in Canada and Lake Trout. I mean, it's 2,100 miles a day. Have you ever done that? Have you gone up to Canada? Not to fished Canada, trout? not done Lake Trout. Uh, well, I have done Lake Trout in Chile. You can get some really big trout, Lake Trout. I have not done the it. The size of your leg, that's kind of <laughs> Yeah. yeah. How big is a Lake Trout? Um, lake Trout, <laughs> well, in Chile, 32 inches. It's really Almost big. three feet. That's really big. Do they bite? Do they bite? Not me. No. Okay. Maybe the guide. What, what <laughs> lakes in Texas do you fish? Texas, I grew up in uh, deep east Texas fishing on a dock for catfish. You okay. ever smelled blood bait? It's nasty. No. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. nasty. But catfishing, catfishing, you see I dropped the G. <laughs> it's catfishing. And oh, that's boy. how I grew up. Who'd you okay. listen to in Texas? I mean, Light Sweet Crude is doing a tour down there. Joe Weisenthal, but in East East, I mean, that's where Don Henley came from. Is that right? Who'd you listen to as a oh, kid in Oh gosh, Texas? I grew up in the '70s. It was <clears throat> Crystal Gale. Crystal Gale. Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. Okay. Dolly Parton. Do you realize the percentage of in our Austin? Of course, it was Willie Nelson. Crystal Gale was gospel. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Willie yeah. Nelson all the way. Once I got to Austin. Yeah. <laughs> Ellen so. Zentner, thank you. This is fascinating. Yeah. Have we even covered the data? No, we don't need the data. It's Bloomberg <laughs> surveillance on yeah. YouTube. And, you this know, is the Bloomberg terminal. Yeah. You know, absolutely. it's like, but seriously here, I, I thank you, Paul. You got a whisper number of 166, yeah. right? I mean, it's just moving around all the time. So, but again, you know, the and consensus is 180, the whisper is 166, moving around all the time. But and you're yeah. above this. We're above it at 220. Nice. Yeah. Wow. We had Mike Wilson earlier this Stanley. week. He says you're on speaking terms. Is that true? <laughs> of course we are. Okay. Yeah. Just want to, you know, be sure. Steve Roach invented this, and it, it, I love Morgan Stanley because any disagreements they have are visible. You know, like like yep. it's okay. no one's on the same page, which yep. I love. Yep. Like Andrew Sheets going to have his own voice, and Ellen Zentner were the great well, leadership. Morgan, I mean, and in my world of TMT, Morgan <clears throat> Stanley was always awesome. Bankers yeah, research. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, they were good. I Ellen beat them. I beat them most of the time, but they were good. If, if we get a two twenty, you got to come back at eight thirty two. Yes. Tell Morgan <laughs> okay. Stanley to wait. We'll get you on okay. the phone at eight thirty two. Ellen Zentner there on uh, Lake Trout in Chile, and uh, also I say Chile. I'm, Chile. I'm an amateur. Yeah. It's Chile, if you're yeah. fancy. And on Jobs Day here, and I really got to say, after the news flow yesterday, it's sort of a a joy to focus on jobs day, which is what we're going to be doing. Futures at negative five. The VIX still sets it all. Thank you, Cameron Dawson, for getting us started. 1286 on the VIX. I look at the 10 year real yield as Ellen Zentner does 2.01%. We're one hour away from an important labor report for America. Good morning on YouTube. Search Bloomberg Podcasts. Subscribe to Bloomberg Podcast on your commute, Apple CarPlay, safer, better. From New York City, Bloomberg Surveillance.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. I'm Lisa Mateo. Little movement in futures this morning. This is ahead of key U.S. payrolls data. Non-farm payrolls expected to confirm a cooling labor market consensus calling for 180 jobs added in May. We'll take you over to the bond market where we have the two-year yield at 4.74%. That's up one basis point. We have the 10-year yield at 4.29%, and that's up one basis point. Want to point out GameStop shares reversing that earlier climb. It was up to 20, 30% at one point. Now it's down 8%. The company said it's going to offer and sell up to an additional 75 million shares of Class A common stock. And this news comes on the same day that Roaring Kitty expected to go out on the live stream this afternoon. Noontime, in case you want to tune in. Apple shares up a tenth of a percent developed a new app. It's called Passwords. Sources say it's going to make it easier for customers to log into websites and software. It'll be unveiled Monday at its Worldwide Developers Conference. And finally, Netflix shares are down about two-tenths of a percent. Shareholders rejected an investor proposal, urged the company to divulge more about its use of AI. And then you have a side note, Netflix facing a defamation lawsuit. It's by the woman who claims to be the inspiration behind that central character in the series, Baby Reindeer. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Uh, thanks. You want to comment on that? Paul? No idea what she was talking. I, no about. idea what she said. <laughs> Baby reindeer, you know, the no. Netflix series. It's about this comedian, and he has a stalker, a woman, right. and she is supposedly that real life woman behind it. Okay. So. Boy, I just too much. Okay. Gotta check it out. Yeah. Weekend, weekend viewing. She's a celebrity lodestone. It's like on the edge of Scarlet Foo. Lisa exactly. Mateo, thank you so much, Paul. What happens when Hello Kitty begins to sell his stock? How yeah. does he sell it? Does he? Well, first of all, I'm not cool? sure what what. <clears throat> what he owns. I don't know what he owns. I mean, we, we don't know what he owns, and we saw that screenshot of There's his... There's options in yeah, long or whatever. Well, we, yeah. again, I don't think anybody really knows what he owns, and the real test for this will be if right. the company comes out with some stock here to sell 75 million shares red, right. red registered, where's the market for that kind of size? In the jobs report in uh, 59 minutes, Blake Gwynn is with us, RBC Capital Markets, head of U.S. rate strategy. Blake, how do you synthesize the jobs report here in 59 minutes into what rates have done. Price up, yield down, 10-year real yield, 2.00%. Check that, 2.02%. Blake Quinn, how, how will you use the jobs report today in your study? Well, yeah, as far as how the race markets have kind of synthesized it coming into it, I do think at least some part of the, the rally that we've had over the last week you know, probably incorporates some some pessimism on the jobs report. I mean, I think there's a pretty clear leaning uh, going in here. Most of the people I've talked to, the conversations kind of skew around, you know, what happens if we miss? What happens if we get these kind of low prints? Um, very little concern for what happens if we get a beat. So, um, so I think some of that pessimism has probably been priced in this rally, but I would say um, it's only a piece of it. I, I think, you know, it was only uh, coming out of the Memorial Day holiday. We had a big sell-off in the other direction. We had this, you know, this big bear steepening, and everybody was kind of scratching their heads trying to figure out, uh, what was driving that? Um, you know, we were talking about options, consumer confidence data came out, but really no kind of smoking gun there. And then the next two days, we, you know, rallied right back to where we were. So um, I think things are very choppy right now. I think we're in a very technical environment. Um, you know, I think the fundamentals are, um, you know, almost in a way taking a backseat, but I think that changes a bit today um, because this NFP print, I mean, we're sitting on some of these kind of key technical levels and rates. Um, you know, the, whether it's in tens and fives and kind of cut pricing for the Fed for this year. Um, and I think I, I think NFP and I think also CPI and FOMC, I think those three events are going to go a long way towards kind of defining what these ranges are going to be for the uh, the first half of the summer here. So, Blake, uh, that's kind of where I wanted to go. I'm just looking at the U.S. 10 year Treasury. We're at four point three percent here. Kind of what it, it feels range bound. I mean, that kind of feels like, I don't know, four and a quarter to four and a half maybe a little bit above that and i know that some folks are saying above 4.5 percent then maybe boy then you could go to 4.7 or higher how do you think about the technicals here the ranges here I, I i think we've been hanging out at that level uh for the last few days because i think markets are trying to figure out whether we're dropping down into that lower range um or if we kind of reestablish the range that you were just mentioning that i think is held you know the held through march and april um, you know, we're trying to figure out if we're, if, if we're still in that range or if we're, we're hopping down to the next one. So I think that's why we've been hanging around very tight with these levels over the last, right. um, you know, over the last like 48 hours or so. Dumb question. 
Can you see if there's a big bet in full faith and credit? Is there a bet right now into this jobs report on the direction, price up or price down? You know what? That was, I think, a topic of conversation last Tuesday and Wednesday. So every time we get these kind of big bear steepenings, um, you know, there starts to be questions kind of coming in and bubbling discussions about, uh, you know, sustainability of debt. So so certainly last Tuesday and, and, and Wednesday coming out of Memorial Day, we saw that big bear steepening. And, and of course, you start to get those questions again. And it came on the tail of um, <laughs> I use the word tail. It came on the on the tail of those uh, three auctions, those two five sevens, which all had tails all <laughs> went uh, yeah. relatively poorly. So. Um, so I think it, it, it lent itself to that kind of, uh, uh, you know, debt sustainability type of narrative. But um, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a fader of that. Um, I know it's, it's a very popular topic. It, um, you know, it, it pulls a lot of attention. It, um, you know, it's great for headlines uh, right. uh, to kind of go out there and, and um, you know, bang on about uh, debt sustainability. But that's a very long term issue. And, and when you ask about, you know, how much positioning is out there, I, I, I think for sure there are people who, uh, lean short rates, you know, tend towards steepeners because they do have a view on full faith and credit or view on debt sustainability. Uh, but, but I just think that's a very hard thing okay. to, to position for. I think we're in a very choppy environment. We have, you know, we're, we're kind of on this precipice of trying to figure out what the Fed's going to do I agree. Yeah. Uh, for the rest of the year. It's, it's well, tough to play a 10 year thesis on debt. We're know? on the precipice here, Paul. I, I was remiss. <laughs> I didn't mention the Sweeney number. We are near 5% in the two year. We've come in a quarter of a yeah. percentage point. Yeah. 4.74 percent that's on the edge of ginormous <laughs> that is so blake when you walk out onto the rbc trading floor what are your traders telling you what are like where, where are the flows going are people buying here are they selling here how are they getting positioned i well i think if you kind of compare to where we were coming into this year um you know obviously we we're pricing in a lot of costs i think you know, if you want to put a scale of one to ten, I think if you if you talk to a lot of real money investors, I'd say probably seven, eight, uh, you know, on that scale as far as longs go. Um, you know, steepeners um, were still you know the most popular trade. I think that positioning has lightened up quite a bit. Um, I think pe you know over the last few months, I think people have gotten a lot closer to neutral. And um, you know, I think what we were talking about before about the ranges, um, I think people are kind of waiting, you know, trying to wait and see what's right. happening here. I think. Uh, you know, in our conversations over the last month, I would say the one thing that keeps popping out is not a directional long or short view or a steepener or flattener view per se. It's not a, you know, a three month thematic type right. of, uh, of view. It's really tactical. I mean, people are looking for carry. They were trying to find trades where, um, you know, I think people were kind of resigned to this range uh, to kind of not really knowing what the Fed was going to do for several months, um, you know, as they right. did lose confidence in inflation and inflation outlook. So they're just trying to find ways to make some money without having that okay. uh, big curve okay. move or the big duration move. Blake, thank you. Blake Quinn, RBC Capital Markets with us here into the Jobs Day. We'll have that in less than an hour for you. A gentleman I've talked to many, many times. He did great work on Duke. He wrote a book about the Duke lacrosse scandal and all that, really yep, yep, fair yep. treatment yep. of it. William D. Cohen in the yeah. New York Times this morning channeling Paul Sweeney. I love how he starts it, 60 Minutes. MTV, <laughs> The Daily Show, it was a cultural icon, yeah. Paramount. Yep. And his sim it, it is just simply this, it's, Paul, you've been so good on this, a slow death of a fabled media empire, William D. Cohen in the New York Times. Yeah, I mean, it's, we, we, we call it Paramount. Global is the name of the company now, but it's, it's the old CBS television network. Uh, it is Viacom and all the cable networks that Viacom owned back in the day. Uh, and then, of course, the Paramount... Uh, movie studio and television studio. So some of the three of the biggest brands in all of media now combined under one ownership. Uh, Sherry Redstone uh, right. and Sumner Redstone's daughter, the control shareholder, you know, uh, supposedly looking to sell this company, but there really aren't any bidders. And we've been looking at this thing for almost a year now, and there's been right. no credible <clears throat> bidders in my mind that if I were a banker, I don't think I see any credible bidders out there. I don't see any yeah. capital markets support for any of the real bidders. So we're kind of floundering here. Did you ever meet Sumner Redstone? The Many picture, times. The picture that Mr. Cohen paints, he says at one meeting, he spit, he's like got a temper like Michael Barr. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> he was a force of nature. And um, I mean, it's a- Did you, you ever know, see him lose it? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, absolutely. I've seen him, I, you know, I, I, hundreds of times I, I met with him and had meals with him and all those types of things. You know, he was one of those media moguls. 
um, where he commanded, uh, you know, Hollywood. And Rupert Murdoch, another one uh, you could put right in, into that uh, range as well. Um, but those days appear to be over. It's become much more of a, um, a, a corporate type of environment out in Hollywood. Um, but again, um, Sumner Redstone and his family still control, and Sherry Redstone, his daughter, still have control stock. And it's a question of what does she want to do? And she's indicated she wanted to sell. Unfortunately, yeah. you know, in hindsight, she's yeah. four or five years too late in selling this company. You know, what's, a, what's amazing is, you know, the temper that you talk about, where they were, you know, the Cohen article is just immense. Yeah, yeah, it's great. It's like when the Tigers lost to the Royals <laughs> a few years back. Like like twenty two to six or twenty six yeah, to two. There were or a lot something. of strows that were down. There, right? there were this is a twenty one run. Twenty six to five was the score. Oof. Royals over the Tigers. Barr just lost it. Yeah. I mean, he just he was. <laughs> they they had to medicate him. With our news in New York City, this Jobs Day, Michael Barr. Thank you very much, Tom Paul Lisa. President Joe Biden just met with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky in Paris as Kiev prepares for what officials say could be a tough summer ahead against a Russian offensive. Biden and Zelensky attended the 80th anniversary events of D-Day in Normandy yesterday. Meanwhile, President Biden says he was forced into this week's executive order on the border after former President Trump convinced congressional Republicans not to back a bipartisan deal on immigration. Biden spoke to ABC. Everybody knows what's happened. We had a deal. It was much broader than this, much better, much more accepted across the board. And he got on the phone and told the Republicans, don't support it. It will hurt me. It will help Biden. Meanwhile, former President Trump was on the campaign trail in Phoenix, Arizona, a crucial state he lost in 2020, but one he hopes to take in November. We need a victory that's too big to rig. You know what that means. We need everybody to get out of the vote. Trump pushed his campaign slogan last night again, we have to make America great again. Today, the defense could get its turn at the gun trial of Hunter Biden. Yesterday, jurors heard from the prosecution's so-called star witness, Hallie Biden, who was married to Biden's late brother, Beau. Parts of the West and Southwest U.S. are bracing for another day of brutal temperatures. A massive heat dome has temperatures in the region soaring into the triple digits, and that includes Las Vegas. Finally, after 41 seasons as host of Wheel of Fortune, final spin for it. Host Pat Sajak signs off tonight. His farewell episode on the beloved game show is said to be a tearjerker. Co-host and letter turner Vanna White says she got choked up when she had to say so long to her friend. You're like a brother to me, and I consider you a true lifelong friend who I will always adore. I love you, Pat. Wow. Uh, White will stay on in her role and will be joined by Ryan Seacrest in the fall. Global News 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. Tom Paul Lisa. Wheel of Fortune. I, I, I would I'd like would be like see if I got on there I'd be like out in one turn. <laughs> Did you see that? <laughs> that show that, here's game it's show so geek simple. coming here. Show started in 1975 mm -hmm. with Chuck Woolery. Yep. And it was on. And then you had the nighttime version with Woolery, and then Woolery got replaced with Pat Sajak, and Pat Sajak has been there with the nighttime version ever since. And you're, this is your expertise on game shows, right? I mean, this is this is the experience of the Michael Barr House. The, Were you ever on Wheel of Fortune? No, but I was on another game show. Which one was that? That was uh, Alex Trebek's classic concentration. Really? You, you were kidding? on with Al you, like you met Alex Trebek. Oh man, yeah, he was giving me cars. He was giving me uh, the. The kitchens and stuff like that. The, six, the, yeah. the six thousand yeah. square feet you've got just west of the horse farms in New Jersey that came from concentration. That was right? I in nineteen eighty nine. I won over thirty three thousand dollars in merchant <gasps> player. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I tell you, in radio, folks, the stories these radio people have, it's just it, just, it never, it's ever like, stops. Yeah, like, it's like, look, I, I, need, I need to get a life. That was also <laughs> the days I had a jerry curl, which I don't want you all to see. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Michael Barton, thank you again yeah, for yesterday's huge news flow. It's Jobs Day. Good morning.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Traders kind of in this wait-and-see approach with key jobs set out less in less than an hour from now. So far, yeah, futures little change. We'll take a look at the bond market. We have the two-year yield, 4.74%, up two basis points. The 10-year yield, 4.30%, and that's up one basis point. We'll head over to commodities. Well, oil prices headed for their third straight gain. We have Brent crude, $80 a barrel. WTI crude, $76 a barrel. Looking at spot gold, it's lower, 2003 134 an ounce. Over to currencies, we have the dollar is weaker. Japanese yen stronger. Euro British pound stronger. We have Bitcoin up 1%, 71,550. Clothing retailer Express, some news there. It's moving forward with a $160 million sale of its business group. Uh, and that includes its mall landlords. And we were talking earlier with Morgan Stanley's Ellen Zetner about fishing, so I thought this was interesting. Tuna fishing, suddenly the hottest thing to do in the Hamptons, Wall Street workers, they're coming home with full coolers because of faster boats and also those big game fish, they're coming closer to shore. There you go. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash, Tom and Paul. So are they in boats or are they doing the thing off the shore with the rods they're in front of They're doing the boats, 18? but they're faster, so it gets them to where they want, so they can get the fish faster. And then the fish are closer to the shore. Sounds so like a woman who knows what she's talking about. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know They're Looks pulling like in it. big fish, those yeah. Wall Street workers. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's Jobs Day, Paul Sweeney and Tom Keen. I'm looking at the data here, ECO Go. I don't know where to begin, Paul. I'm going to go to the unemployment rate. If you said 3.9% yeah. unemployment rate two years ago, seven years ago, 12 years ago, it'd be nirvana. Right. Price to perfection. Yeah, I mean, it's like a boom economy. And we've been at this level or <laughs> even lower for you know a very long period of time here. So, um, I mean, the labor market has been, you know, I guess the economists call it fully employed. Now, a look at the front pages. What's making news around the world? Your daily roundup of today's headlines from major publications. You got to get through the newspapers, folks, because. Paul's completely bent out of shape about the song we're going to end with, so we got to explain that. Oh Your daily look at the front pages with Lisa Mateo, brought to you by Interactive Brokers. Interactive Brokers, they charge dollar. Margin loan rates from 5.83% to 6.83% rates. Subject to change, learn more at ibkr.com slash compare. Lisa, what do you have on a Friday? Well, we got the Associated Press. They're saying the number of zombie companies on the rise. We're talking about companies, so much debt, they're struggling to survive, barely able to pay even the interest rates on their loans. So here are the numbers, Associated Press analysis. The numbers soared nearly 7,000 publicly traded companies around the world, 2,000 in the U.S. alone. And that includes like companies that run Carnival Cruise Lines, JetBlue, Wayfair, <clears throat> Peloton. So these are big companies. Yeah. Um, and the AP is saying a lot of them won't survive because the dates are approaching when they have to start exactly. you know, paying those loans. And they I, might two years ago, it. Paul, uh, my theme for the year was a great zombie roll up. Yep. Maybe I was early, but here it is. Yeah, you've got companies that uh, you know have higher <clears throat> levels of debt uh, and they have them at low rates. Now they got to refinance these things and the rates are so much higher here. Um, it really calls into question their ability to pay interest, to pay the principal and all right, those right. Type, types of things. So it's not, it's not unusual in this type, part of the cycle, but here we are. And if they go bankrupt, that's even worse because they have all these workers and, and, and that becomes a Well, but the debt's here. It's like, it's like the commercial real estate, the office buildings, Class yeah. B, Class C. Yeah. You know, you extend and pretend and you wait and you wait until you can. I mean, I wonder over the weekend, what will we see nationwide in foreclosures and the other things but a company like real estate. Carnival Cruise Lines, they will earn their way out of it. You know, like the market doesn't have any concern about a company like that who's got, you know, growing. Have you ever done that, like the 15-story tall? Cruise. I was in no, Venice no, once, no. and one of those boats yeah. went right by, Massive. just like in the movies. Massive. It, it was like it was to me. It was rude, but there they are. They're huge. Massive. Next, no great business. Do it. Uh, you were just talking about this, the NBA and and the yep. broadcast rights and all that. So this is kind of a sidebar. You had the NBA commissioner Adam Silver. He said the league is going to turn to expansion, probably go overseas. <coughs> you know, beyond the Toronto Raptors. You know, go beyond. Right. Um, after this whole TV deal thing works out. He said he's thinking long-term, Mexico City actually considered a contender for a new NBA franchise. But you'll have a lot of people who are interested in, right. in owning teams. If LeBron James retires, LeBron right. James could be a part of it. Um, Shaquille O'Neal says he's expressed interest in ownership of teams. Right. 
I, I mean, what's interesting here, Paul, and let's go to row four at the next game where Paul Sweeney holds court. <laughs> and the answer is, will it dilute the game? I mean, are there enough players out there to yeah, do there, NBA expansion? There are plenty of players, particularly internationally, Tom. So many players in the NBA come from uh, Europe uh, in particular. I mean, they could start a league. The NBA could start a league in Europe tomorrow. That's how global the the, the basketball league is. is basketball so you uh, mean so much more global league, than even American football. A separate league, or London plays New York Knicks. I don't know. I mean, I think the logistics there would be very difficult. But I'm just saying that the basketball as a sport is a global sport more so than say American <clears throat> football. Yeah. American yeah. football, you bring that over to London, they've been doing yeah, it, it for work. years. I've been in a bar. It's right, fine. I, I mean, it's fine. I mean, people like fine. it, but it's but Perfect. they don't. But you know, in Europe, Spain, uh, all over, it's a, yeah. it's a global business. I've done the NFL just outside the Tower of London in a bar selling to Americans, and it's just not. I mean, it's foreign. Yeah, that's all there is to it. Yep. What else do you have to do? Uh, so the New York Times talking about concerts and if they're starting to die out. Um, you had Jennifer <coughs> Lopez, she canceled her concert. Um, 2023, it was a good year, right? You had Taylor Swift, you had yep. Beyonce, Drake, Bruce Springsteen, you know, he was 2023, but there have been cancellations. Some sales are <laughs> slowing. Um, you had Coachella, those tickets normally sell out, but there were still some available when it opened. So they're saying um, that the, the market for concert tours could be slowing, but other people are saying, you know what, it's good. Live Nation is saying so far sales are up from the same point. Well, what do you think? I mean, when yep. you go to see Bruce, what's the night cost you? Oh, it's car. Yeah, yeah, it's dinner. It's, yeah, cr yeah merch. it's crazy, but it's a it's a once in every two or three, four, five year type type thing. So you just blow it off. But I think mm. the issue for concerts, Tom, was that was one of those businesses coming out of the pandemic when we switched from just buying goods like Peloton bikes right. to experiences, and one of the big experiences was going back to concerts, and that yeah. we've had. 22, 23, were just right. blowout years. What I learned this week, back to what I learned on this this week is Lizanne Saunders is never going to see Taylor Swift. No. <laughs> she, you know, maybe she'll see Black Keys or something with an yep. edge to it. But the major thing we learned on surveillance is Lizanne Saunders no. is not going to be in Paris with <laughs> no, Stephanie Rule and Mohamed. Stephanie Rule was there. She had a whole big Watching Taylor. Yep. I think, I think Lisa was there. She just won't admit it. What else do you have this morning? Uh, oh, this summer is for Tom. sleepaway camps, okay? This is what we're talking about. Not sure if you ever send your kids over to summer sleepaway camp, but moms and dads are dishing out even more money. They're hiring people to pack for them, to pack their kids. Oh, please. So the sleepaway it's camp itself is like 15 grand. Out okay. of <laughs> control we fortunately paul has to talk about a song <laughs> to save me this is a total american scam yep. in america you basically pack up the bedroom and move itty bitty to camp it's, yep. it's, it's just ridiculous yeah damien was talking <clears throat> about this just i'm honored day. to say yeah. that afterthought will be going to a camp in scotland wow. and basically the page is they may bring one knapsack and one suitcase that's it that's it. That's my kind of camp. Oh, <laughs> see, the problem is these camps now, they have like 100 item That's lists. That, the packing lists the are packing just list unbelievable. unbelievable. Yeah. So they're hiring these organizers for like $125 <clears throat> oh, an hour to get them there and also to, to pack them when they come back. So that way the okay. kids have their stuff packed, their laundry's done, they come home, oh, mom just opens up the case. And that's it. They Please. can spend more time with the kids. Lisa Mateo. <laughs> Lisa Mateo with the newspapers on a Friday. We now turn to the angst that's out there. Springsteen did The River, which, which I, like, think, I think yep. I had three copies of. And they had an album, and his wonderful manager, John Lando, said, there's no hit. And so this genius, one night in a hotel room, wrote a song that was a ginormous hit yep and it was un-american because it had synthesizers you've <laughs> never recovered no. from the synthesizers and dancing in the street uh yeah dancing in the dark i mean dancing in the dark I, I excuse mean, me i'm a huge bruce fan so i'll never say i dislike a song i'll just say it's my least favorite song of, of bruce but he as you mentioned tom he set out to write a number one song he never had a number one song he wanted to have a number one song so he wrote what he thought the radio industry uh really wanted a pop type of song yeah. um so i've heard steve van zandt say don't do it don't do it don't do it don't put it on the radio don't put it on the album don't put it on the album he put it on the album why it don't was you a big bring hit. paul please bring in this song <laughs> dancing in the dark our good friend bruce springsteen from south jersey i go to bed feeling the same way i ain't nothing but tired man i'm just tired and bored with myself 
Hey there, baby. I could use just a little help. You can't start a fire. You can't start a fire without a spark. This gun's for hire. Even if we're just dancing in the dark. is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. We're addicted to the parlor game, the yep. Fed, the monetary ballet. Where do you see opportunities in a fixed income space here in 24? With Lisa Mateo on markets. AI affecting demand for cloud computing. And Michael Barr with news. Another legal setback for Donald Trump, this time across the pond. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning, everyone. In 30 minutes, a hugely anticipated labor report, the two reports for the United States of America. I know President Biden will be watching from France. He'll be uh, briefed there as he uh, 
cel uh, celebrates the remembrance of the 80th year of the D-Day invasion. He met with Mr. Zelensky here within the last two hours. I'll say a, a busy day for the president across France, including uh, that horrific Rangers wall that is no, uh, wow. that, at Normandy where so many Americans sacrificed. Uh, for all of us, uh, we don't have a space launch today, but we do have... Hello, I'm sorry, it's Hello Kitty. It's going to be on YouTube. And, and Paul, previous $46, and now we're tra we've gone from 65 to 40 since Lisa wrote the newspaper. Yeah, report. I know, exactly. So stock down about 14%, 13% of pre market trading on that news that they're filed 75 million shares for sale. I just, I don't know what to make. I don't have anything intelligent to say. <laughs> I'm just not going to get That's the there. best problem. Bloomberg surveillance this morning. We're brought to you by Cohn Resnick Advisory. Assurance Tax. Cohn Resnick, they can help you improve business resilience through a comprehensive risk management solution. Visit ConeResnick.com. On Jobs Day, we spell it. C-O-H-N-R-E-Z-N-I-C-K. Cohn Resnick. Dot com. Paul, do you have a guess? I never, once I got the payroll thing almost right. Yeah. So since then, I've never guessed it. No. But but today, Zentner's higher. I know. I know. Morgan Stanley. Yeah. You always got to pay attention. The whisper's like a 160. Right. Exactly. I'm lost. I don't know where to go. I don't know where it's going to go, but it's going to be, we'll find out at 830 Wall Street time. Is McKee with us today? Or is I don't he, know. you he know, the be, Red Sox won 14 to yeah. 2. He may you have know, taken It's a Friday in the summer. You never know where he is. You know, well, maybe we'll have Mike McKee sucker with us. Suit and, as well. A little green on the screen. I'm going to call it fractional here. Futures up three. Uh, with our Bloomberg business update, here's Lisa Mateo. You got it. And the countdown has begun. We're about 30 minutes away from jobs. A traders kind of waiting on the fence. We have futures still little change. That report expected to show employers boosted payrolls by 180,000 last month, slightly more than April, with the unemployment rate seen holding steady. We'll take you over to the bond market. We have the two-year yield, 4.74%. That's up one basis point. The yield on the 10-year, 4.29%, and that's up one basis point as well. Moving the markets, yes, GameStop shares really taking a dive. They reached more than 30% in the pre-market right now. We have it down about 13%. First quarter results showed net sales declined in the first quarter. Then the company announced it's going to sell up to 75 million additional shares. Coming just hours ahead of Roaring Kitty's anticipated return to YouTube. We'll take you to sure. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing. They produce the semiconductor for NVIDIA, Apple, ADR is up about half a percent. May sales <coughs> rose 30 percent. That was thanks to strong demand for AI. Also a recovery in some consumer electronics. And finally, Lyft kicked off its first investor day yesterday. Said it's expecting a 15% growth in bookings over the next three years. Their shares are up about 3%. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash, Tom and Paul. Let's do this right here quickly. We've got a wonderful guest, Katie Kaminsky, to get us going. I, I don't understand how the drivers make money on Lyft. All the drivers I talk to say they're not making nearly what they made a year ago. Uh, yeah, I don't, it's that, that take rate, you know, and I don't know how much the Lyfts and the Ubers are allocating I it. uh, yeah it's a it's a tough business that's why it's it's always a, i always think of it as a second gig i don't know many drivers where that's their primary gig and that goes to the whole question of are they employees or are they contractors yeah and without, the but, without exception everyone that and they bring it up i don't bring it up they're making less than yep. they made 12 yep. months that's ago a tough, that's what they tough gig. say she's making more than she made 12 months ago Catherine kaminsky <laughs> joins us right now katie kaminsky chief research strategist alpha simplex uh, here katie just simply is there a bull market trend in place? Gosh, that's a great question for today. This week has been rough. Um, I'm a little concerned. I mean, the signals are still there, positive for equities, but mm -hmm. this week really made me pause, um, thinking that some of the themes have changed significantly. Okay, in what way? Come on, you got to give us some well, details. Why? Rich, yeah, I mean, I've been Rich from Madison Square guys. Garden emails in and says, why? Yes. So what's really interesting this week is we saw massive synchronous moves cross asset. Look at what happened to yields. I mean, they just plummeted over the last week. You've also seen uh, commodity markets really spooked me the most. I think we saw a massive reversal in commodity trends, which had been very higher for longer pro inflationary. Um, and the dollars also struggled. So it's been a very risk off week right. in some sense. So we had a a really different moves than we've seen earlier this year, which makes me nervous. And what's so important here, Paul, with Katie Kaminsky at Alpha Simplex, it's the work of Andrew Lowe at MIT, and it's all trend-based, 
and it's all within it and within the range, and that goes to where the range is on fixed income as well. Yep, absolutely. I mean, there's. I look at uh, Katie's uh, CV. There's a lot of MIT there, Tom, and that makes me very nervous because they're they're good at the the math thing, uh, and I told there wouldn't be math here. So, Katie, for someone simple like me here, if I get a jobs number that's in line with kind of where the consensus is. What's the Fed going to do with that kind of number? Is that going to give them some more confidence to just sit on the sidelines maybe? Well, it's just another data point. But, I mean, I think if we have an, a consistent number, it's really about the whole picture. And if you look at the data more recently, it started to trend weaker. And why I said this week really made me nervous is for the first time, the market seems to be reacting to that. So we're seeing this sort of bad news could actually mean something bad um, instead of it being really a rate cut story only. And that's yep. where I get a little nervous. Do you feel like, I mean, there are a lot of folks out there, uh, Katie, that feel like this Fed is already behind the curve in terms of uh, lowering rates here, that the data actually suggests that they should be cutting now. They should have been cutting maybe a couple of months ago. How do you think about that? I mean, this is a good point. Look at this week. We had already two central banks cutting this week, the ECB, the yep. Bank of Canada. Um, it's very rare that the U.S. is behind the curve, uh, and usually it takes the lead and others follow. But you're definitely seeing if we start to see weak data and we see some demand destruction, so this potential that you know we can't <clears throat> withhold this level of demand, that's going to make me concerned that we're going to see a pivot. And we're going to pivot to rate cuts, but will they right. be early enough and will they be enough? Are you making a bet on yield within a range or are we at, you know, on yield or at support where you need to reestablish a bet if we break through support to higher price and lower yield? This is a good point. We are hitting some reversal in the fixed income signals. I mean, you probably remember, I've been pretty much a stickler on higher for longer most of the of this year, and you've seen short fixed income positioning. Yeah. And this week is kind of an indication that we're starting to pivot um, and hit some of those levels where you're seeing um, signals and in fixed income shifting more towards long eventually. Right. Um, it's obviously going to take time, but there is a sense mm -hmm. of a pivot, whether it's a head fake or yeah. an actual directional change, it's right. still unclear. Can we go Matthew, Paul? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we're going to go Matthew on a Friday with Katie Kaminsky. Katie, within the analysis here, the equation <laughs> on the right side is a Greek letter epsilon, folks. It's oh, a cutesy pi E. What's the systemic risk out there right now? What, how big is the epsilon, the unknown unknown, as say someone mm -hmm. like El, El Arian would say? I would say in, within the last week, the, the risk that I perceived has increased in the sense that we saw very consistent themes in the markets. But as you start to see synchronous moves like we saw this week, that often is an indication that there's some risk that's perhaps not priced at this point. So I think what worried me is more this demand story. Yeah. Is there some level of demand destruction Weaker economy also means weaker demand. At what point does that actually suggest that we could have a harder landing than we thought? Because right. we kind of have kind of nodded off that. We've kind of let it go a little bit, but that right. came back into picture for me. On week. the markets, Katie Kaminsky, thank you so much. Alpha Simplex uh, this morning up in Cambridge in Boston. PhD Chosen. in operations research from MIT. Oh, yeah. What do, I mean, if I walk up to Katie like at a Starbucks, I got nothing to say to her. No, no, I, she's at a I bar. The she's Red Sox. You go to you see her bar. She's reading, you know, something out of Imperial College with like yep. six six integrals in. Yeah, it. I don't know about these people. You know, they're they're in the X Y Z space. They are. Uh, futures up to its job day in twenty minutes with the VIX twelve point seven one. With our news in New York City, Michael Barr. Tom Pauly, so thank you very much. President Joe Biden publicly apologized to Ukraine's leader today while in France. It's over the six-month wait for funding for weapons <clears throat> claimed on a per paralyzed U.S. Congress. But Biden says it ultimately allowed battlefield gains for Russia. President Biden told Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky he was sorry that his war-torn country got caught up in American politics, pledging to stand by the Ukrainian people. The United States is standing with you. You are the bulwark against the aggression that's taking place. We have an obligation to be there. And... Uh, so I'm looking forward to having a detailed discussion with you about where we go from here. The funding also covers munitions. 
Former Trump White House aide Steve Bannon has been ordered to turn himself in to a federal prison starting July 1st. Bannon refused to comply with the subpoena issued by the House January 6th committee. The former White House aide was convicted of contempt of Congress and sentenced to four months in prison. Outside the courthouse, Bannon said this will not stop him from speaking out about what he says is an unfair justice department. There's not a prison built or a jail built that will ever shut me up. The judge who presided over Bannon's case said he could stay out while his appeal was pending, but it was rejected last month by a three-judge appellate panel. Prime Minister Netanyahu accepted an invitation to address both houses of Congress next month in Washington. Bloomberg Steve Fotisk is in the nation's capital. House Speaker Mike Johnson's office announced that Netanyahu will address a joint meeting of the House and Senate on July 24th. Netanyahu is facing intense criticism over the civilian death toll in the war in Gaza, which has caused divisions among lawmakers and led to public disagreements with President Joe Biden. Some Democrats, including Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders and former Speaker Nancy Pelosi, have said they would boycott the address. This would be Netanyahu's fourth speech to a joint meeting of Congress that would make him the first foreign leader to do so that many times. In Washington, Steve Potusk, Bloomberg Radio. Global News 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. Tom Paul Lisa. Michael Barr, thanks so much. On YouTube and YouTube Live Chat, please stay there. Give us your thoughts on the jobs report. Subscribe to Bloomberg Podcast. Search Bloomberg Podcast. Good morning in your commute on Apple CarPlay. Paul, there it is. ECO Go. I'm looking at the two-month Payroll net revision. Last time around, it was 22,000 light. Yep. Anna Wong says maybe now, but even in the coming months of this report, we're going to see some big revisions. All right. Well, that's uh, <clears throat> I definitely pay attention to what Anna Wong is saying. I'm just looking at the numbers here on the Eco Go here consensus. Change in non farm payrolls, Tom, 180,000 is a consensus. That's a big number. Uh, for this period. It seems like so. I also look at the average hourly earnings here, uh, looking for an increase of 0.3% month to month and you annualize that, that's about 3.9% wage growth. That's solid, it's less than what it had been. So if you're looking for some moderating, moderating wage right. inflation, maybe you're starting to see that a little bit there, but that would be flat uh, kind of you know, month to month. Wholesale trade sales come out at 10 o'clock. You and Alex are gonna have that. And yeah, hopefully Alex has some, something to add there. You know, but, Bitcoin you know. 71,000. I look at wholesale trade sales and that reminds me of the fruit in the, in the yogurt that Lisa has for breakfast in the morning. Now there's Fruit Loops upstairs. <clears throat> I was going to get her a bowl of Fruit Loops and put it on her desk, but then I thought the better of it. There you that go. Pro that probably would know. not have been well received. They do have said. blueberry scones though downstairs, which I did enjoy. Really? <laughs> there's a downstairs? <laughs> LL2, that's where oh, they have the good stuff, sorry, right? Sorry, upstairs. Oh, upstairs at number six, okay. I'm all over the place. Okay. Blueberry scones. I've never. Have you ever known this? Michael no, because Barr? we're we nobody we're wants on the fried air. catfish in the morning, do they? <laughs> no. <I don't> think. <laughs> there you are with the kids. Thank you, uh, uh, Ellen Zentner, for the catfish update. Jobs day soon. Good morning.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. We are 50 minutes away from key jobs that could lock in some bets on interest rate cuts by the Fed in the coming months. It follows policy easing from the, easing from the ECB, also Bank of Canada. JP Morgan Chase and Citigroup, they're still predicting that the Fed will ease next month. Over to the bond market, the two-year yield, 4.74%. That's up a basis point. The yield on the 10-year, 4.29%, and that's up one basis point. Few companies making news. We'll start with Tesla. They're down about two-tenths of a percent. An investor sued to challenge that proxy vote over whether the company should move its corporate home to Texas. Also reapprove a $56 billion pay package for Elon Musk. Then we go to Samsung, Samsung Electronics. Electronics. Its largest union will actually went on strike for the first time over pay. They plan to resume normal work hours next week. An executive departure over at Stellantis. Their shares are lower. The former U.S. head of Jeep, Ram Brands, Jim Morrison, he has left the company. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Lisa. Greatly appreciate it. A little green on the screen. NASDAQ up two tenths of a percent. This is a joy. Usually by phone to the left coast, way too early in the morning, and in studio now with us is Julia Pollack, who is the most twisted, interesting economist we talked to. She's with Zip Recruiter. I don't think they're a Wall Street firm, would we say that, Paul? No. Zip Recruiter is like digital stuff. hip. Yep. You know, it's like cool. You got to be cool to work there. Yep. And what she brings is prodigious academics. She's got parchment. She survived. Who would you have Ek Ten at at Harvard? Greg Mankiw, of course. You survived Mankiw at Harvard. I did, and Ken Rogoff and Marty Feldstein. Did Ken ever throw chalk at you? <laughs> Ken is the, a sweetheart. <laughs> I don't think he's ever thrown chalk at anyone in his life. <laughs> is, is this job economy anything Martin Feldstein taught you? To me, off the pandemic and with the technological advancement that ZipRecruiter owns, this is not Martin Feldstein's job economy, is it? No, but I think the lessons about public finance and fiscal responsibility probably are timeless. So he would probably point us in that direction. Yeah, I think he would. Absolutely. Absolutely. What do you see here in, in 10 minutes? It's always twisted and different from what we get from Wall Street. So last time I happened to be uh, right on the money. And so I'm worried this time that I could uh, mess up. But I'm actually expecting this report to be hotter than expected. Uh, all the focus this week has been on a swath of terrible economic data, but it's not really so bad. The big dip that we saw in GDP now, that reversed yesterday. Uh, the um, ISM services number was very hot. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing good data. And then in our marketplace, which has been a better predictor of, of the jobs market than anything else I've seen lately, uh, job postings are firm. Well, that's kind of, when I think of Zip recruiter, I think of the young folks. I'm not yeah. a zip recruiter guy if I'm looking for a job. I'm going to probably make a resume and walk around and hand it out to people like I did back in the day. <laughs> Fax it. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Um, but that's not how the kids do it today. College graduates, for example, how's that market look for folks just kind of coming into the workforce? So a lot of the headlines are very gloomy. But if you look at what's actually happened this year, youth employment rates have been going up and up and up. And we could actually get the highest May rate uh, ever. I mean, participation across the board has been pretty strong. Prime age participation has sort of stalled. That was growing rapidly, and now it's flattened this year. But young people are participating at very high rates. And we've also been, I guess, over the last, I don't know, five, six months, there's been more discussion about the illegal immigration and how that's impacting just the labor market in general. Um, what's, what's your data show? So immigration across the board, visa immigration, yep. legal immigration, they all seem to be very high and uh, having a meaningful uh, impact on the number of applications per posting uh, across the board. Right? Skilled immigration is high. Um, so we have seen applications for, for most kinds of jobs go up 10, 20, 30 percent. So it's more competitive out there. If you're looking for a job now, faxing it is not going to work. Not going to work. Nine minutes, right. from the jobs report. Nine minutes from the jobs Nine report minutes. today, folks. Good morning, Paul Sweeney and Tom Keene. We'll be taking you beneath the headline data with us. Uh, Julia Pollack now, Ira Jersey to be with us with a huge bond reaction. And Paul, just to frame it out, I'm hearing some enthusiasm from Julie Pollack and Ellen Zentner that I'm not seeing in a 180 statistic or the whisper of 166. Yeah, exactly. 
How about if I'm, a, uh, I'm an employer here, I'm looking to find talent, and we heard for the longest time, you know, during the pandemic, coming out of the pandemic, it's been as challenging as it's ever been. Is it right. lightening up at all? I mean, I look at the jolts number, still high relative to historic levels, but coming down, I guess. Yeah, so uh, labor availability and quality are improving. Employers uh, have, have some better opportunities out there now. Uh, and they're facing a challenge on the other side. So between 2024 and 2027, we're going to see peak retirements. Instead of 10,000 people retiring a day, we're going to see like 11,200 retirements a day. And wait, 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 give, give me that number again. 11,200 a day. Wow. So All right, Tom and I will not be one of those. I'll just Can tell I you right now. Can I ask you a question, ZipRecruiter? Yes. My boss got his resume out. I mean, we, all, we have our resumes are in storage. Sure. Liquid nitrogen. Yeah. <laughs> Do resumes matter anymore? What does ZipRecruiter say? So there are some employers who are, you know, crusty old employers who like to see resumes and cover letters. But the way it works these days in many, many industries is that you just create an online profile you answer a couple of questions, it populates your profile beautifully, and then you can apply to most jobs with but one what click. what I hear from kids, flat out, it's who you know. That's what I hear uniformly from the 20, you know, 20 to 35 crew. I don't think you that's don't the case at all. Absolutely yeah. not. I mean, I got my job cold at ZipRecruiter applying on ZipRecruiter. Excuse me, Harvard, <laughs> yes. Party <Seriously>. Rand. <laughs> yeah. You go to the top of the pile. Tell us about Party Rand. Um, I, I literally studied for the CFA in the Frederick Party Boston University Library. Yeah. But he worked at Rand, which is the research combine. And Party Rand, he single handedly built. It's so hard, Paul. You have to go to graduate school in Santa Monica. It's so hard. You get surf breaks between classes. It's perfect. And it's a very practical program. Right? This is a rare program in which you have to work while you study. And that is what so many people are missing today. The data is really clear. If you get an internship, if you get an apprenticeship, you're much, much, much more likely to get a good, high-paying job. You get a job faster. You, like, 60% of people who have pr uh, previous experience uh, among those young right. first-time job seekers, you get a job within a month, only 30% if they don't have. Are the experience. teens getting jobs this summer? I mean, when Paul and I, we, Paul, you and I always had jobs. Always. My mother wanted me out there at 13. 15. I had a paper route. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine me on a paper route, bow ties, you know, <laughs> on a bicycle? Are teens getting jobs or have they been taken over by immigrants? Well, so the, you know, the teen employment rate went down for decades in a row as more and more teens stayed in school and went to college, but it's been picking up. And uh, we could actually see the highest teen employment rate in today's report uh, since the Great Recession. Really? See, I, I, the highest May rate, sorry. So is this, a, is this a fully employed economy? I hear that term, I'm not sure what it means. I mean, we got 3.9% unemployment. Is that kind of fully employed? Pretty much, almost everyone who wants to find a job can find one, but it's not that way across the entire economy, right? In healthcare, we see insatiable demand for workers. Hiring right. is much higher than it was before the pandemic. That industry has added 750, well, 760,000 jobs in just one year, about three times as many as before the pandemic. Right. In tech and white collar fields, it's a little slow. Quick on the economy, Dale Jorgensen at your Harvard, is there a true productivity lift going on right now in America? That is a huge debate. I mean, the productivity data that came out this week was- A little soggy. Yeah. Was, Jason Furman said- It was yeah. mixed. Uh, I mean, the unit cost data, though, the, the implications for, for labor unit costs were great. They have risen only 0.9% over the year. That points to slowing okay. wage growth and good inflation numbers. Julie, don't be a stranger. Come in every job day, fly in. Yeah, day. exactly. Julie Pollack, thank you so much. Thanks. Zip Recruiter, and I really can't say enough about uh, her effort in Santa Monica with uh, Party Rand is called. It's a really unique graduate program out in the ferment of LA uh, education. Uh, right now, we ferment over to the fixed income market. Ira Jersey's with us, and it's incredibly uh, well timed on this jobs day. Futures up to the VIX 12.7 at three as we are four minutes away from the jobs report. Ira Jersey, if we get an on target number or the whisper number south, are we going to see price up and yield down? 
Uh, I do think so. I think that's the uh, direction of the market. You te you've tended to see recently as numbers came in, come in, you know, kind of on the weaker to as expected side, uh, which which is generally a little bit weaker. Uh, you've seen the market continue trends that have occurred the week or so before uh, before these data. So, um, so, so yeah, I think the path of least resistance is for slightly lower yields. Um, I think for the 10-year, though, it'll be really hard to break much below 4%, even if we have a really weak number. So, Ira, we have seen the, you know, the 10-year Treasury, you know, as and the two-year as well, just kind of yields coming in over the last week or so. What are you hearing from your clients these days about that? Yeah, people aren't taking big conviction trades right now. Um, you, you know, earlier in the year, a lot of people were in yield curve steepeners, thinking the economy was going to slow. We were going to get, you know, five or six rate cuts, and and that would uh, uninvert the yield curve. Um, but but now people have been burned by that trade uh, once or twice, and uh, they're not willing to necessarily take uh, big duration bets. Um, you know, I was been talking to some clients this week that are a little bit concerned that the that the markets, uh, risk markets in particular, are a little frothy, so they don't want to get underweight duration at this point. Um, so a lot of people have covered and and are are much uh, positioning is I think much cleaner now, which of course means that if you do get a, a significant miss or beat on uh, on some of these data coming out the next week, uh, you could actually get pretty big moves as people actually enter new positions. So what is the you know I know you don't do trades, but Ira, what is the thing within full faith and credit, the metric, the spread that you will monitor at 831. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm not going to look so much at the curve, but uh, but at outright moves. So where where does the two-year yield move to? And then we look at the uh, obviously a lot of the derivatives markets. Do we price in or price out some 2025 cuts? Keep in mind, you, you know, we keep on talking about this year and and uh, you know whether or not the Fed's going to move and when they're going to start moving. But the important thing for most of the Treasury market is really what is the terminal rate? So where once the Fed starts to cut interest rates, where are they going to go to? Um, and now we're right. only priced for them to cut to about 4%, and, and that's a significant change from, from earlier this year, and, and that's one of the reasons why you have 10-year yields and five-year yields where they currently are. Paul, get one more in here before the report. We had some auctions recently, Ira, and you know I don't pay attention to those things, but I that's why we pay you. You pay what, more what attention than I do. <laughs> Ira, what did you take away from some of these treasury auctions? What did they tell your market? Yeah, the auctions last week were pretty weak. Uh, the demand slipped uh, quite a lot. It was actually the worst auction week that uh, that I can remember in, in quite some time. Uh, we had three auctions all all, uh, all detailed. I think part of it was just the timing of when they occurred right after the Memorial Day weekend. You had two auctions on a Tuesday and then a, one on a Wednesday. And um, I suspect that some people didn't have their senior traders on the desks to put in <laughs> competitive bids. So I think that some of it was technical. Uh, but, but also, you know, people didn't want to necessarily get in front Right. of um, a market that, that seemed to be rallying pretty uh, pretty dramatically. All right, Jersey, stay with us, and he will give us some wisdom here at 8.30 as we begin to see market reaction to this report. We're one minute away from this jobs report. Again, two reports synthesized into one. We'll look at the non-farm payrolls out there. Paul, it's a 180 statistic, and you said 166 is a whisper. Yep, W-H-I-S, get to those uh, whisper I didn't uh, numbers know from the streets. There's yeah. like a code. Okay. Yeah, Tom from the sixth floor has got a function for everything. So again, non-farm payrolls looking for 180,000. Last period was 175,000 uh, here. The unemployment rate looking to hold steady at 3.9%. That's the consensus there. And average hourly earnings up about 0.3% uh, on a month-to-month -month basis. That'll be a little bit higher than last month. Good morning. Out on your commute on Apple CarPlay and Android as well. The Bloomberg Business app, it's free. Thank you on YouTube. Love the build out of the audience for these key economic data. On live chat as well, YouTube, you search for Bloomberg Podcasts, subscribe to Bloomberg Podcasts, and worldwide and across this nation, just good morning to all of you as we stagger to this uh, report. Any good numbers here? We'll see what wage growth looks like, the unemployment rate, 3.9%, uh, and of course, the non-farm payrolls. I'm looking at the revisions. Let's take a look right now at what we see. Oh, Ellen Indeed. Zentner, yes. home run. Oh, <laughs> Julia Pollack, home run. Paul, do you think the markets will move? I think the markets <laughs> will move here. Change in non-farm payrolls came in at 272,000. Again, the consensus was 180. Uh, thousand last period was 175,000, so well above. The unemployment rate jumps from 3.9% uh, to 4 uh, percent. Uh, average hourly earnings, the consensus was for a month-to-month -month gain of 0.3%. 
That came in at 0.4%. Came ticked up. And then yep. year over year, I still look at that, not month over month. I've got a 4.1% hourly earnings, and the revision moves from 3.9 to 4%. Uh, Some, you know, revisions lower <clears throat> in non-farm payrolls, but they're completely overwhelmed by that. And Tom, 272 percent statistic. We're seeing that in the bond market, Tom. The two-year Treasury, which was flat before that, is up about 10 basis points. We're at 4.82 percent on your two-year Treasury. Uh, so a big move there. We're and back the, to uh, the Sweeney level. Yeah, the S&P futures, Tom, uh, down about 25 points. It was pretty, or 22 points. It was pretty flat going into. I this. think this doesn't the the, the June like. Do I have to show up for the Fed decides next week? Exactly. Uh, hey, let me let's call out our good friend Ben Emmons. Uh, he was pretty much spot on this yeah, number. So very good. Congratulations, yep. uh, Ben Emmons. There's some trophy takers out there. Uh, one, one. We'll get to Ira Jersey here uh, in uh, a moment. Again, I'm watching the two-year yield, the Sweeney statistic, 4.84 percent, ginormous 12 basis point move to a higher yield. We'll see if we get over a 490, and back on a, the worry, if you will, about a five percent. Uh, yield. All of our economic indicators each and every day, and of course, on this important jobs day, brought to you by Commonwealth, supporting more than 2,000 independent financial advisors with the solutions they need to grow a thriving business. Commonwealth, go where you grow. Visit Commonwealth.com to learn more. We are commercial free for you on YouTube and across Apple CarPlay. Good morning to all of you in the conversation will be intense. Lindsay Piega, well-timed to be with us here in moments. We do the Commonwealth mention because Ira Jersey needs time to digest the impact on his bond market, and it is a continued impact. Two-year yield out, 12 basis points, heading for 13. Ira Jersey, your thoughts? Yeah, so obviously, you know, strong report on the face of it. Uh, th that that non-farm payrolls number, obviously, uh, you know, well above what everyone one thought. So, you know, importantly, yeah, we, we've moved 10 basis points, 11 basis points in the front end of the curve and all throughout. But if you look at the SOFR futures, so these are what oh, replace boy. LIBOR futures and are really the right. short term interest rates that that where people play where they think the Fed's going to go. Um, we've actually priced out an entire cut for the cycle um, just on this payrolls report. So um, so, so when you look at, uh, at, at SOFR futures for the end of 2025, up 18, 19 basis points right now that's uh you know suggesting that that people are optimistic or or more optimistic about the uh the economy people taking off their um kind of uh economic uh, disaster hedges here a little bit um and uh, not too surprising just given the strength of this report and like you said tom um you know i'm focused on a lot on that that wage number uh because wages lead to spending even even more than quite frankly the, the headline uh, jobs number so hey, just remind us ira how does the fed think about the labor market how important is the labor market to the fed in their calculus well it's key to everything right because it is one of the pillars that they have to uh, abide by so when you take their um you know their mandate it's it's stable prices and um and and uh, uh full employment so um you know we, we it's it's hard to say that we're not right. near full employment when you have wages growing <clears throat> like they are and you have so many job gains every month. Um, there is a little bit of a disconnect here, right? Because of the uh, uh, obviously the household survey showed that the unemployment rate ticked up a little bit. Um, I haven't had a chance yet to dig into some of the, sure. the details of that, but um, you know, but but there there is this weird disconnect between the survey data, the two different surveys that they do. All the right. establishment survey showing obviously a lot of strength. Household survey maybe a little bit less strength. We have a CPI report. June 12th. Is that in the bond market yet, or did we have to wait for this jobs report before we start looking for a June 12 FOMC meeting and June 12 CPI report? Well, I think we're going to shift to that uh, now. Now that we have this report, I think people right. will be, you know, searching, uh, yeah, you know, thinking about that CPI report and how it might affect the uh, decision that ultimately uh, the Fed makes. Not, not in June, right? J June, the, the Fed's not going to do anything. But, um, but if we, you know, you need now even a weaker than you would have CPI report to start pricing in additional rate cuts. Um, so, yeah, you know, people who think that the and, and still had uh, calls for a July rate cut, I think they're going to have to revise those at this point yeah um the data is just too strong right so 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 at this point and and this has been our feeling it's going to be hard i think for the fed to cut prior to the election we're not going to get enough data enough weak data probably yeah. um for them to even cut in september um you know two months of weakish data isn't going to do it when you've had this 
string of very strong data over the last couple of months. Ira Jersey, thank you so much to Bloomberg Intelligence. Look out on the terminal really within hours for his and his team interpretation of what we see and they'll look forward to the key CPI report next week. Did you know that one of our interns programmed the guest today, Bennett? Really? Bennett programmed okay, the guest good. today. Does Segui from Ira Jersey over to Lindsay Piggs it just Perfect. It, with this report? It's like, it's like poetry. Joining us now, the one person I want to talk to, we're commercial free here through the half hour. Good morning, huge audience out on YouTube. Good morning to all of you. Lindsay Piegza joins us, who's pushed way against consensus, and has said this is a Fed of stability or even rate increase. Lindsay, you look like a genius this morning. Are you going to look like a genius in 30 <laughs> days for the report come July? Well, I, I think so. Even if we did see a, a hotter than expected print in, in even the next one or two inflation reports, it, it's not going to be enough data to convince the Fed, particularly against very clear, tight conditions in the labor market. And the most concerning component of this report for the Fed is going to be that wage component. We continue to see pressure on wages as labor demand outpaces labor supply. And this is not something that's going to be fixed overnight. This is a rebalancing that is going to have to occur over months, a prolonged period. And so when we look to the Fed, who's telling us they need very clear evidence of disinflation, many months of that evidence, that says that while rate cuts may be eventual, eventually does appear to increasingly be a 2025 event. You know, Tom, this top live blog continues to be my go to when you get yes. these big, big things. And here's something just posted there. The 272,000 uh, payroll gain was bigger than every last one of the 77 estimates in the Bloomberg survey. So uh, there you go. Uh, Lindsay, where's this demand for labor coming from? I mean, who's hiring all these people? Well, I, I think it's pretty broad based. There, there isn't one sector of, of the economy that's booming. What we're seeing is an overall steady level of expansion across several key categories of the economy. Now, again, I, I don't want to oversell what we are seeing in the labor market or the broader domestic economy, because we are starting to see somewhat of a rebalancing. Labor market conditions, absolutely, they're still tight, but they are somewhat less tight than what we saw, not just at the start of the year, but over 2022, 2023, so we are starting to see a rebalancing, but the problem is the overall impact or, or that, that rebalancing is occurring at a much slower pace than the market right. or specifically the Fed had anticipated. So again, uh, still positive, yeah. but we are starting to see that second derivative decline. I mean, Paul, I, you get out the HP12C. Yep. I mean, if you know, if you got pigs Go on, you got to get out the HP12C. And I do the three months moving average, which in March was a big number. OMG, April was a lesser number. And now we just got another big number. Lindsay, I'm rocking 250,000-ish over the last 90 days per month. Six years ago, that's a boom statistic. Are we in a boom labor economy? Well, I, I do caution against reading in too much to the headline payroll number because we are starting to see somewhat a divergence between the payrolls and the household survey. Payrolls are consistently reaching new highs month after month, but the household survey really has shown somewhat of fatigue and plateauing over the past, I would say, six to eight months. The disconnect, of course, reflecting the fact that we consistently undercount the working age population, particularly now as we see these large flows of immigration coming into the economy, uh, legal and illegal. But also what we're seeing is this shift in the demand or the type of jobs being created in terms of full-time versus part-time. Now, I haven't dug into the details of this report specifically. Last month was almost entirely full-time, but if we go prior to that, six to eight months, that was almost entirely part-time employment, which as we know, part-time hires typically have more than one gig, and then of course you're counted more than once in the payroll report, which could artificially inflate that number. So again, still positive, but I do think there's some underlying signs of the economy starting to cool, that, that rebalancing, as I mentioned. So we had 4.1% average hourly earnings year over year. 4.1%, that's well above the 3.9% consensus. Last month was also revised a little bit higher. 
wage inflation, is that a thing? Well, it's certainly a concern, absolutely. And it's a concern not just for the Fed, but wages. Uh, surprisingly strong wage data for the BOE, right. the ECB, that was also noted as a concern for the pathway going forward. So even as we see some of the supply side components providing ample relief to inflation, as economies reopen, trade lines come back online in the aftermath of COVID, what we're seeing is some of these variables under the purview of global central banks are showing less improvement as we have allowed, in some ways, inflation to become entrenched in the economy with central banks sitting on the sidelines and allowing above target inflation for a, for a long period of time. Lindsay, when you were taking your PhD, you had the unenviable task of studying the terror for Michigan, Claudia Sam. And of course, Claudia has been forceful that we don't have enough evident data for recession. Clearly, she's been right. She's on with us in a moment, folks. Clearly, Lindsay Piegs has been right that, that the economy is much better. But how, how bifurcated is the economy now between the haves and the have-nots? Well, I would push back. I don't think the storyline is between the rich and the poor, the have and the have-nots. I think the divide is between the asset holders and the non-asset holders. Because what we've seen is while the average American household is still out spending, they are feeling pain from higher prices, higher borrowing costs, the resumption of student debt payments. But there's another category of consumers that have experienced a massive increase in net wealth to the tune of $12 trillion over the past year. And that's possible thanks in part to this massive increase in asset prices via the equity market, via the housing market. So when we paint with a broad brush, the consumer remains resilient, that's very much true, but the level of resiliency is very much divided between the asset holders and the non-asset yeah, holders in this economy. Uh, Lindsay, thank you so much. Dr. Piegs, it was Stiefel here, and of course, she's done a yeoman's job of pushing against, they're going to cut, 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 uh, just saying, everybody calm down and wait uh, for uh, the data. To let you know where we are now, we've got Claudia Sam coming up in moments. Because of, is it Roaring Kitty? Do I have that right? I don't know. At least Jess Menton's going to brief Roaring here. Kitty. I was like, you know, why do we need to talk to Jess Menton about Roaring Kitty? And the answer is we've gone from 67 to 36. We're now breaking down to a new low this morning. So we'll get to Jess Menton yeah. on Roaring Kitty. GameStop down 23% right. pre-market trading time. Uh, they had some news that they filed to sell up to 75 million shares to take advantage of this, right. what had been a 160% increase in the stock this year. Speaking of Hello Kitty, uh, Claudia <laughs> Sam joins right now with her cats that she herds uh, on a weekend basis. Claudia Sam, uh, of course, providing all sorts of important economic analysis, hugely influential uh, right now uh, with New Century Advisors. Uh, Claudia, you nailed it. You just everybody's saying Claudia Sam's right, recession, recession, and you're like, wait for the data. Is this enough of a is, is this enough of an oomph positive jobs report where you're not looking out to the first week of July, but you've got to get out further to get any kind of caution on this economy? This is good news today. Jobs days have been good news uh, in the past couple of years. We see a resilient labor market. We have had a job full recovery for the first time in a very long time. And that's good. So, you know, I, I understand that sometimes markets think good news is bad news and it's bad news for the Fed. Yeah. No, this is good news for the Fed. People have jobs. This is good. I mean, I mean, the Fed starting when they look like a genius right now in terms of the parlor game, which I don't care about. But the overlay of that is a sub 2% GDP growth. Is that embedded into your study now, where you're looking at finally real GDP growth actually pulls down? So I will channel uh, Fed Chair Jay Powell and say, we look at the totality of the data, right? We have to okay. bring all the pieces together. You can't just look at the labor market and say recession or not. I don't lean just on the SOM rule and it's my rule, right? So, and it's very important, a couple of pieces, always look under the hood, right? We need to see the consumer keep going. We need to see the businesses investing. We've largely seen that it's gonna be bumpy and never take one month and run with it. Like we really have to look three months, six months, and if you do that story, you've got the moderation. Today is not throwing that off, but it's a good moderation. It's a sustainable 
path we are on. But Paul, I'm going to go, the three-month moving average is like 250 on non-farm payrolls. Solid. Ten years ago, that was a boom economy. That was a boom economy. It looks like we're fully employed, I, I guess. Let's look at the wages here, Claudia. Um, we had last month re revised up a little bit to 4%. Uh, this month, it came in at 4.1% on an annualized basis. Um, is that wage inflation? Are we looking at the wage inflation there? We have seen no evidence of a wage price spiral through this entire cycle. And if you didn't see it in 2022, I have there is no story for it right now. Again, we need a resilient economy. We need paychecks out there. So people keep spending. The Fed is going to wait. That's just kind of how they roll. So we want to make sure that that patience on the inflation side does not take us all down. And it looks like they got they got some resilience. And that's good big picture, not just for the Fed and their waiting game. So. Claudia, how do, you, how do you think about the immigration, both legal and illegal, and how that impacts some of the data we've been seeing over the last, I don't know, six to 12 months? It seems to be getting a little bit more play out there. So first, from the lens of the economy, the immigration, the pickup in immigration to this country has been good for the economy. We had widespread labor shortages, and those really, by and large, are taken care of. Was it just immigrants? We had women coming back strong. We had other people and marginalized groups coming in. But we needed workers. They weren't displacing workers. They were filling jobs that weren't getting filled. That's good. Of course, bigger picture, there's a you know conversation to have about how we do that in an orderly way. Right. Now, so that's the economy. Just what you asked about with the data, yeah, throw one more measurement challenge at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, right? Like it is just very hard to survey these people. They might show up in household survey, they might not, they might show up in the establishment survey. Right. So, but we have a lot of things that are making the data hard to read right a, now. A threat to society, Paul, is always an economist that pulls out Merriam Webster. <laughs> Claudia Sam with a blistering essay for Bloomberg Opinion here in recent days. Claudia Sam on inflation. What did you learn in your study? I mean, of course, you have to quote University of Michigan statistics. I get it. It's the franchise out there. But, but Claudia, what is the character of the inflation into this summer? Right. So the point of the piece was, yes, there is when we talk about inflation, people are upset about inflation and economists try and convince them that it's getting better. This is more than economics, right, because we are talking about the same thing, an increase in prices. Right. That is an economic phenomenon. But there is a lot more that's getting wrapped up in inflation. And if we're going to have a productive debate, we need to get the economics sorted out, put the economists in that bin. And then there's another discussion and bring in other experts. Like, let's stop pretending this is all about the economy. So, Claudia, where does this Federal Reserve go from here? It sounds like, and I'm looking at the market here, boy, they can just wait. No problem waiting here and maybe even into next year. The Fed has a dual mandate. So regardless of what the Fed, quote unquote, can do, the Fed, when inflation is back down on a sustainable 2%, they're supposed to be out of the way. Their goal is not to lean on, nor is it their mandate, to lean right. on the economy as long as possible. So I think that's, you know, this today is a good day in saying, hey, we're not careening towards a recession. That could lead to really fast cuts, very disruptive. Right. And yet, I don't think there's anything here that says, oh, the Fed's going to wait until next year. Okay, Claudia, I got one final question. We need to go to Claudia Sam mm -hmm. territory. Yep. Claudia Sam, you know that the science diet CD stress bag for cat food, it's a moonshot. <laughs> it was $100 for an 18 pound bag and that puppy's popping $114. I'm seeing the same thing for the do for vet bill and kennel fee as well. Claudia Sam, you're seeing inflation in your cat food, discuss. Yeah, so I think I'm doing what a lot of Americans are. When things get more expensive, you go switch to a cheaper brand. Puffy, my kitty, she's more than happy to eat dry Purina cat food. It was on sale last week. There so we go, Dr. Sam. <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Sam on the substitution effect. Puffy, Puffy is uh, Purina <laughs> cat food. Just man's going to walk out of the studio. Dr. Sam, thank you so much for joining us, and can't, congratulations. Without question, the most influential academic economist of the recent uh, 12 months. Uh, they're forcing me to do this, folks. Roaring Kitty called me up, says, stop calling me Hello Kitty. <laughs> and 
you know, I was like, okay, just met, and after the jobs report, we're going to do GameStop <laughs> for a couple minutes. And I'm sorry, there's theater out there, Jess, 67 to 36, down 45% since the last time you were in the studio. That's right. So giving an update here. So as you know, Bailey Lipschultz on our team, he's uh, his beat is, is basically the meme stocks. I heard he was supposed to pick up his marriage license today, but is that right? But you know what? We, we put him to work, unfortunately. Oh, no. I overheard an editor say, you know what, get him in here now. And sure enough, you know, they didn't even have to really tell him. He already was up. Yep. Uh, I think he's working from home today because Good. he has it's to. It's work from home yeah, day. Yeah. It's a work from home day. you got to keep the fiance happy. But nonetheless, <laughs> giving an update here, if you are looking at GameStop stock, GME is the ticker symbol on this, down a little over 20%. So on the back of building on what we knew from earlier this morning, they did announce their earnings earlier than expected. was supposed to come out next week. They are front running this ahead of that live stream that Roaring Kitty or Keith Gill is supposed to do around noon on YouTube. And the other part of this is the filing, though, that they said that they may okay. sell up to 75 billion shares of class. For you, Jess, you're so wired in, and Paul just mentioned <laughs> top live for the jobs report. Yep. You're completely wired into this, Jess. I am. How does he sell right. legally? Exactly. And so that's what gets complicated here because he's deep in the money. So the options at 20 would in order for him to basically below that would to lose money. So he's I mean, the question, why do it now? So the company put this on the table in order to prevent to front run this. But if you look from an options perspective, we were actually trying to crunch some of the numbers here. So if he exercises all the options around 40, that's still like 17 million total. So that would be around 680 million dollars in, in it, holdings could, there? Has he already done it? I mean, so, is it possible he will announce That's what YouTube people are wondering that, during the live stream if that is what ends up happening. So then if he exercises the day, the stock could potentially rise yeah, to 150. Right? So then everybody is trying right. to potentially buy and cover if that does happen then. So that would be basically kind right. of like a gamma squeeze that we saw in oh, 2021, oh, where the market you. makers they, are trying to buy the stock to neutralize the risk. There. Gamma squeeze played cheap trick like no one. <laughs> Did you like my questions there, Paul? Yeah. I, I mean, got them from Bailey. He's over at Bergdorf Goodman yeah. in the wedding <laughs> department. Exactly. Getting, getting, me getting here, his tux ready. So, I mean, <clears throat> as this kitty guy, has he, does he do these live streams? Is this the first oh, no, no. time? So he, he, this just came out. That, so yeah. he started this live stream. So, well, he, it hasn't <clears throat> happened yet, but now he has this YouTube channel that okay. he did not have before. Okay. And yeah, what I was explaining me. earlier this morning to y'all, I was talking to securities lawyers that used to work at the SEC about this. So he has some that appear to be disclaimers underneath some of yep. it right now. But what they were talking about is, you know, some of the language there they felt like either a lawyer didn't write this or not a very good one is what they <laughs> worded it to me. Okay. I'm not going to name yep. the, the lawyers that told me this because they told me this off the record, but <laughs> that uh, basically the language needed to be massaged more about, you know, what, okay. if, whether he was buying or selling securities. When is a YouTube broadcast? Noon, New York Noon. time. Wall and we Street expect time. him to talk about his position, well, his well, outlook for the company. Well, see, none of us know yet, okay. but what we're wondering if he does exercise today. So if that's the oh, case okay. and the stock shoots up, we could see right. a squeeze kind of similar to what we saw in okay. 2020. We got to summarize the jobs report. Just met and flying Great in. Great stuff. <laughs> Parachuting <laughs> in, I should yeah, say. Exactly. With, uh, what'd you say, that kitty guy? Yeah, that's the probably kitty guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's exactly. Tom's favorite. Yeah. Uh, is we're going to get Just met in there with our equity right, coverage and a great team. They are Chris Condon leading our economic coverage, U.S. payrolls, unemployment, they pick up. We call it a mixed view of the job market. There's some nuances in there. Ira Jersey alluded to that. But it's just simple. Here's the single sentence from Mr. Condon. The job market has largely defied expectations in the past two years, powering the broader economy. Yep. And yet Atlanta GDP is sub 2%. I don't get it. No, I, I, I don't baffled. either. And that labor market is just, again, as you mentioned, Tom, just kind of defies expectations. Uh, and uh, in terms of what the Fed might do, we're seeing it in the bond market right here, the two-year Treasury, uh, up 14 basis points 14, here, Tom. 14, no, wow. We're back to 4.86% uh, on your two-year, and that's obviously the most sensitive to kind of Fed moves, good in indicator. Still lifting as well. The 10-year yield rockets, the real yield, I should say, 1.99, and we're out to a ginormous 2.12%. That's a substantial a lift in the yield structure. Futures at negative 27. NASDAQ futures, half a percent. Let's not forget we're going into the Apple silliness 
next week, the developer conference. I was not allowed. They said I couldn't go unless they had white soul sneakers. No, yeah, I don't do that game. And, no. and I just said I don't have them. No. Send Ludlow. And exactly. So I think Ludlow. Even was, David yeah. Weston is going to the uh, sneaker is. route. You know, He's Lisa's kind of my go-to Lisa fashion Mateos, plate guy. You know, she's she's got Celine sneakers. Or, there, oh, there, there. Oh, oh yeah. look at them. Folks, Ari, get those up there. Yeah, the now, folks, like on YouTube. Dash and forward. Look at those kicks for Lisa uh, Mateo. Yeah, they show my, my real shoe size, which is ginormous. <laughs> They're Please. glory. They're glory sneakers. <laughs> Sweeney medicated after the disastrous song of the last hour. Yeah, we're better. Let's here. make Paul happy. Glory days. Mr. Springsteen, good weekend to you. Future's negative 26.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweet. Are these stocks under-owned by institutional Wall Street? A lot of these companies talking about generative AI. With Lisa Mateo on markets. Investors just worried about the ongoing sales slump in China. And Michael Barr with news. A ship traveling through the Southern Red Sea has been attacked. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning, everyone. Tom Keen, Paul Sweeney. Post Jobs Day is the weekend started, Paul? Um, almost. <clears throat> almost. Give me three, three more hours, and then we'll be started down on the Paul Sweeney at 10 a.m. They're looking forward, and of course, we'll have into your your ending of that show. You yep. will have Roaring Kitty as a guest. Uh, hopefully, we'll, we're, <clears throat> we're efforting that, as they say in the business. Maybe he'll start early and keep it uh, yes. going. We say good morning to you on a Friday after a bang up American jobs report. Markets adjust. Futures at negative 22. The yield space higher, the Sweeney yield, the two-year yield, 4.86%, now up a solid 14 uh, basis points. So Bloomberg surveillance uh, this morning, and we're brought to you by IBKR, financial advisors switch to interactive brokers for lowest cost global trading and turnkey custody solutions. No ticket charges, no conflicts of your interest at IBKR.com slash IRA with our business flash, Lisa Mateo. And we've got futures falling, yields spiking higher. Payrolls came in much stronger than expected. Let's get to the numbers. We have NASDAQ futures down four tenths of a percent, 77 points, 18,984. Dow futures down three tenths of a percent, 147 points, 38,810. S&P futures down four tenths of a percent, 24 points at 5,340. Let's look at the bond market. The two-year yield, 4.86, down 14 basis points. We have the 10-year yield at 4.42 percent, and that's up uh, 14 basis points as well. Want to take you over to GameStop. Those shares have really taken a dive. They've reached more than 30% in pre-market, now down 19%. That company announced it's going to sell up to 75 million additional shares. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Lisa Mateo, thank you so much. Paul, your thoughts on the jobs report and the, the yield lift that we've seen? Boy, resilient, I guess, is the word that comes to mind yes. for this U.S. labor market, up 272,000 jobs here. It is. It, 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 the resiliency absolutely captures it. Can we do a sh group shout out? Ellen Zentner nailed this. Oh, yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it, Morgan Stanley, Julie yeah. Pollack at Zip Recruiter. Yeah, we had some smart people. Nailed it. And to, to, to state it, and Anna Wong was very good on this, she said it's going to take time to get the revision adjustment that she's writing about yep. is now. It is a tradition. She's acting Labor se Secretary for President. Uh, Biden, in conversation with our Joe Matthew, whose balance of power heats up into the summer. Here's Mr. Matthew with the Labor Secretary. We are here with the Acting Labor Secretary, Julie Su. And Secretary, it's great to see you this morning. Me Thank too. you for joining us on another Jobs Day. Uh, we've got a bit of a mixed signal here in this jobs report. More payrolls than expected and a higher unemployment rate than expected. Which survey, household or establishment, is reflecting reality? Well, this is another very strong jobs report. I'm not going to get tired of coming here and telling you <laughs> that we are continuing to experience very strong, stable, and steady growth. So it's 272,000 jobs created last month. Mm -hmm. The unemployment rate has remained at or below 4% for 30 months straight. That's still the longest since the 1960s. And at the same time, real wages, you know, over, over the year are up 4.1%. So uh, workers are doing better in an economy economy in which the president has said when we focus on workers and worker well-being we're going to do what's right for uh, the economy and for the country. When you look under the hood you find that 400,000 even more than 400,000 people left the labor force in May. The participation rate is not back where it was before COVID right now. How do you explain that? Well, so let's say, you know, the, the prime age labor force participation rate remains very, very strong. And it's worth noting that, again, women's labor force participation rate hit another historic high. So last month we said it was the highest since 1948 when this data was begun to be collected. It's now a little bit higher than that even. So women continue to power our economic recovery. Uh, at the same time, you know, we are seeing, again, strong participation. People are in the job market. People have come off the sidelines. People are looking for jobs, and they're finding them. Where there has been a little bit of a, um, you know, of a, uh, of a, you know, very small uptick in the unemployment rate, again, still 
at or below 4% for the longest stretch in decades, sure. uh, but um, has to do with uh, young people ages 20 to 24 who are in a bit of transition, really, if we think mm -hmm. about May, right? May is a period of transition for all of us uh, parents with kids who, who got graduate and maybe move and, uh, you know, are looking for different jobs during that time. You can tell a great story and put a great headline number on that unemployment story as you are right now. But when you look under the hood, you de do see some elements of weakness compared to the payroll survey. And I wonder, while you're happy where it is now, if you worry about where we're going to be six months from now, if this is a slowing job market. Well, the payroll survey really is the gold standard when it comes to the unemployment rate, right? This is the, you know, it's, it's the largest by far of any data set, including the household survey, that is used. And so, again, I don't think there's any way to paint this as other than continued strong, stable, and steady growth under President Biden's leadership and proof of his theory that if we invest in America, we can create good jobs in, in communities and, you know, crowd in private investment in order to do that. And, and, you know, as I travel the country, I'm seeing the benefits of that. We've talked a lot about the impact that immigration has on our job market. Uh, can be for better or worse, depending on the trend that you're looking at. And there's an analysis from Steve Englander at Standard, Standard Chartered Bank that we looked at this week that estimates about half of the job growth since October can be attributed to undocumented migrants, that it's somewhere in the area of 109,000 a month. If the president's executive order put in place uh, just days ago lowers the threshold, lowers the numbers of undocumented immigrants entering the country, what does that mean for the job market. Do you see numbers like that in your modeling? I mean, I haven't seen that study. I would actually question those numbers yeah. based on what we see. Right? At, it, this is a situation where, one, we're not talking about dividing uh, a small pie into smaller pieces. We're talking about a much bigger pie overall. So more jobs, more people in the labor market, more opportunity uh, for all. Mm -hmm. Since the president came into office, again, we've talked about this, you know, 50, about 15 million jobs created. That is a uh, 15 million families, 15 million individuals uh, who are having the benefits of a good job that might not have had that before. Um, I would also say that it is true that there has been, you know, immigration-based growth also, and that has been true throughout our nation's history, right, that immigrants have helped to uh, do jobs and, and help fuel the economy, but the majority of uh, this job growth that we're talking about has gone to native-born yeah. workers. Well, talk to me about the other side of this story, and that's immigration reform, H-1B, H-2B. We spend all day talking about about border security in Washington. What does our job market need in terms of attracting talent from other countries legally? I mean, it's such an important question, right? This is why, since day one, President Biden has called for the kind of comprehensive immigration reform that would address, uh, you know, some of the challenges that our system has created. What would our job market look like with that help? What would our job market look like with... with if you got that reform. Right. Well, so we do administer... You know, we have, in this administration, increased the number of uh, H-2B workers that mm -hmm. have come in. Uh, we recently did a rule around uh, um, H-2A workers, making sure that when uh, migrant workers come to this country through legal means, that they're also protected, mm -hmm. right? That, 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 that they are um, protected for their own good, but also so that their being here doesn't um, uh, take away from, uh, you know, the, the, the good wages in those industries. Mm -hmm. uh, so, we, you know, but the, but the bigger picture is that there does need to be comprehensive reform. The president has called for that, and frankly, Congress needs to do its job. There's something uh, that I don't want to get too deep in the weeds called the birth-death model that our analysts at Bloomberg Economics are looking at that would suggest some of the companies that we've seen closing might not be reflected yet in the numbers that we saw in this monthly survey. Based on layoff announcements, corporate closures, where do we look in the middle of summer when these numbers start to emerge? Well, you know, we, we will come out every month to report uh, the, the data that we have, but everything that we have seen this past month, this past year, as well as, you know, the, the, the last year since President Biden came to office is historic job growth. More jobs created during the same time period than any president uh, in, in our history. Uh, and continued low levels of unemployment. Again, historic lows. And more opportunity to come, right? The investments in the president's investing in America agenda, have, many of them are still coming out. And that's why this summer I'm going across the country talking sure about are. good job summer yeah. and focusing on the importance of uh, what a good job does. The for good family job principles summer tour. You're right. like Beyonce. You're, you're launching a national tour and it's not a mistake. I see some of the states you're going to like Pennsylvania and Michigan. What is your message to voters in those states? 
Well, my message to working people is that we see you, we have your back, we know that you have uh, talent and desire, and we want to create the kinds of opportunities that will allow working people to have a good job where they can be paid a living wage and live a secure life. Mm -hmm. And our message generally is that when you build a workforce that is ready, that is trained, that is skilled, that pulls the full talent of the American people, it's good for employers, it's good for our economy, and we see that time and time again in these jobs numbers. Yeah. Getting back to the household survey, which is important to us and our viewers and listeners, the fact that it reflects agriculture, the fact that it reflects what's happening in people's households, does, does that not raise the level of importance of the household survey at this point when we look at that against payrolls to get a sense of not as even as much where we are now but where we're going i mean i think the bigger you know the answer is the payroll survey is the survey that tells us how many jobs have been created what industries they've been created in and again this the growth we're talking about is not just single industry right it has been for the entire time, but certainly this last month is no different, very, very broad base. We saw growth in leisure and hospitality. We saw it in construction. We saw it in professional services. Uh, we saw it in healthcare. And so, the, you know, th there's really, the numbers don't lie. There's, it's, it's really, um, you know, a broad based, solid, continued growth. And I think that coveted soft landing that so yeah. many people uh, bet against. Well, I haven't even mentioned that yet. It's my job to ask you if we're in the soft landing. I haven't heard words like Goldilocks this morning. What's your broader 30,000 foot view on that? You're looking at your slice of the economy. That's the labor market. Is a soft landing intact? I think so. I mean, again, it's the kind of thing where we're always vigilant about where the economy is going. But based on where we were, remember, in 2021, right, the president came into office. COVID was raging. There was no national strategy to address it. Unemployment was very, very high. People didn't know if they were going to get toilet paper if they went to the supermarket. And now we have historic job growth, low levels of unemployment. I think it is the very definition of a soft landing. You mentioned COVID. It's not the first time we've brought this up as a barometer, maybe a baseline for where we are now versus where we were before the pandemic. It's still impossible to forecast, isn't it? You see these payroll numbers blowing off the charts based on estimates, not just by the government, but by Wall Street and economists who are a lot smarter than I am. When will we be able to get a handle on what comes next? Well, I mean, I think the, the you know the reality is that's why we don't look at any one month's numbers as at, you know at, w over relying on them to tell a story. But the story of this economy, from January 2021 until now, is of steady, stable growth shared prosperity and more investments to come. We know that, you know, that, that there's more work to do. We're also seeing the lowest levels of like black, white unemployment in a very long time. So it's equitable growth too. And that matters a lot. What would a second Biden term mean for the job market? I think we continue to deliver, right? We continue to build a strong economy. We continue to invest in, uh, in, in American industry in a way that hasn't been done in decades. So building, you know, restoring roads and bridges, making sure that every family who turns on the faucet gets clean drinking water, making sure that everybody breathes clean air and has access to high-speed, reliable internet. Those are the kind of infrastructure investments. You know, we're, you know, the, we, we, we want to build the things that we invented, right? So bringing manufacturing back to the United States, I think it means, you know, continued opportunity for the American people. Will you still be in this building if there's a second term? Well, I, you know, I don't want to make predictions about that. I do serve at the pleasure <laughs> of the president, but it has been an honor to help to deliver on that vision. Well, I'm glad you could join us on another jobs day, and we'd love to meet you back here in a month. Thank you. Thanks for the time, for sure. as always. The acting secretary of labor, Julie Su. Joe Matthew with Julie Sue. Interesting discussion there. A little bit of pushback from Mr. Matthew. I mean, there's a message there from the administration, but uh, the president's going to fly back from France. There's a state dinner, I believe it's tomorrow, right. right, Paris. I assume a tired Joe Biden with all the emotion of Normandy. Exactly. Flies back to a nation that's developed 240,000 plus jobs every month for the last 90 days. I don't think, Paul, if somebody's sitting with him in the Oval Office on Monday, he's going to go, how yep. or why? Yep. Do we know? I don't think we do. I, it's been a solid, consistent, <clears throat> resilient job market. And I think for if you're the administration, I'm just not sure that message is getting out there uh, to, the, to the degree that they would probably like. Because uh, it is, uh, you know, I'm yeah. looking at the unemployment rate. Uh, it did uh, <clears throat> uh, stick, sticks right there. It's actually up at 4%, uh, but still pretty solid. Wages are up 4%. 
4.1%, so a solid yeah. labor market. There. Welcome all of you on YouTube. Search Bloomberg Podcast. Subscribe to Bloomberg Podcast. One of our interns, Bennett, has killed it today with guest sequence. Because right now we're going to look much more almost philosophically at what this boom labor economy means forward for your investments. Nicholas Colas is co-founder of Data Truck Research and joins uh, this morning. You know, Nick, there was a phrase from another time and place that it's a morning in America. I guess it's a morning in America for a select group. How narrow are the haves right now in America? Bang up jobs report, bang up consumption. We see it across the tri-state area, but how are the haves doing as we go into the summer? Certainly the haves are, are having it all. I mean, it's, it's a very good market. It's a very good economy for the upper 20% of the income distribution, but let's be fair, it usually is, right? The, the wealthy tend to have an easier time of it. The bottom 80% have not had an easy a time of it. And we see that in data like gasoline consumption, for example. Gasoline consumption has actually been down year over year for the last two months. So as much as the top 20% are doing well, there is a lot right. of stress in the broader market. Paul Sweeney, bank rate 30 year mortgage, 7.56, April 25th, and in two cups of coffee, we're down to 7.25%. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's still not where we needed to go for a lot of folks. So, Nick, given some of the economic data we've seen, and we've got a Fed Reserve that says it is data driven, how do you think this, the Fed plays it out over the next several months? I um, mean, it's pretty clear at this point. This jobs report doesn't leave a lot of room for uh, interpretation. Let's put it that way. The economy, labor market, still strong. Demand for labor is still strong. Wages are still strong. Uh, they have to, at best, be on hold. It's really interesting to see how many dots or how many cuts they put into the dot plot next week. I'm guessing it's one now, not two. And they've got to play it pretty close to the vest and, and acknowledge the fact that. As much as they want to see the economy slow and wages slow and inflation slow, it's happening only slowly. Right. Nick, we see the uh, two-year Treasury moving higher by 12 basis points today to 4.84%. But we've seen all year this equity market can perform with rates at those levels even a little bit higher. So how do you think about the equity market for the remainder of this year? You know, I think large caps, certainly still fine. The S&P 500, absolutely fine. It's up, call it 12% year to date. In the face of higher rates, as you point out, we've got the Gen AI story, we've got NVIDIA, we've got all those things pushing large caps higher. Small caps, not so much, right? Russell's up, what, 2% year to date? It's telling a very different story. It's telling a rate sensitive story as it always does. And so the rest right. of the year feels very good for large caps and kind of not for small caps. Nick, there's such a respect on the street for your research across assets. What is the character of this bull market? The character of this bull market is very narrow, relatively speaking. Actually, we just did a piece for clients last night looking at the whole decade's return so far, the all the 2020s, because let's face it, it should have been a really bad decade. It's turned out to be a pretty good decade, but it's narrow. So it's Lewis large caps, not small caps. It's Europe is doing okay, but emerging markets are not. For every India, you've got a China. So it's a very narrow rally, and obviously bonds have gotten destroyed for the last four and a half years. Going forward, I think it'll still be narrow. It's gonna be narrow till US large caps, US technology, and hopefully we get enough of a pullback in rates to get bonds to work. But I can't say enough, Paul, how this is a Nick Colas difference, yep. and that we have so many people rationalizing a destroyed bond market, price down, yield up four, five, six standard deviations, by looking at spreads, looking forward, forget the past. And what I hear in emails and on YouTube, so many people are underwater in some way or yep. form with bonds. It's tough to claw back to what happened from 2022. But Nick, I go out and buy a two-year treasury. I'm getting near 5% here today. What's wrong with buying some fixed income here these days? I think you're right. I think it's a great trade. I think two years are probably the easiest trade on the planet right now, 5% <laughs> risk-free. No need to worry, no need to fuss. Maybe the, maybe U.S. equities do 10, but you're getting five for doing absolutely nothing and taking no risks. So fives feel pretty good. <clears throat> the interesting part of the curve, obviously, is 10 to 30s. What do we do with TLT or the longer end of the curve? And I think you can own that section of the curve here. I don't see inflation rich, ricocheting higher again. And I think you'll make a little bit after inflation, uh, even at the longer end of the curve. Hey, Nick, so in the equity markets, you talked about the breadth or the lack thereof breath. I mean, I learned in business school, that's not a good thing. I mean, doesn't this market have to see a broadening out here or 
we're set up for maybe a big fall somewhere along the line? You know, it's it's a great question, and you're right. I mean, the, the classic theory is, you know, you want rallies to be broad, broad based. We just don't have a broad based equ equity story right now. We have one thing. We have generative AI. We have one stock. We have an Nvidia, and so the, the philosophical or the the fundamental leadership here is is sound. It's a good idea. Gen AI is a powerful trend, but there's not a lot of ways to play it. So you have a very narrow set of leadership. It's basically, as we all know, five names. So I don't think it's necessarily unhealthy, right. but it does mean like small caps aren't way to play Gen AI. There's no, there's very yeah. few Gen AI plays in small caps. You got to go large caps. And Nick, on a reading list this weekend for all of Wall Street's Michael Mobison over at Morgan Stanley doing a wonderful study. I have already read it, folks, on concentration in the market. Nick Colas, how do mere mortals? I mean, forget about the phrase, a carefully diversified portfolio <laughs> or balanced portfolio. All this mumbo jumbo from 30 years ago. How do you partake, Nick Colas, given the concentration that Michael Mobison writes about? Yeah, well, first of all, I I've known Mike for 30 years. He's a genius level intellect, and that's a great piece to read. That Putting that aside, what he says is, the way the stock market's behaving is rational. We are getting a lot of profit growth in technology and generative AI kind of themes. So it doesn't say it's fairly valued or over or undervalued, but there's a reason why stocks have worked out this way. And the question is, will it continue to work out this way? Will we have this concentration of returns? And the short answer, I think, is yes. Where else does human innovation kind of hit the fulcrum point of profitability harder than in technology right. and Gen AI? Right. That's why tech works. That's why the stocks are working. Nick, don't go away. I got a scream out on YouTube. They're like, Tom, give us a data check here with all that we've done here with uh, the labor secretary. We missed that. Here's what you need to know, folks. Futures are negative 20, they're now improved. Negative 12 off the shock of a boom jobs report, the VIX 12.83 as well. NASDAQ uh, doing better, down only two tenths of a percent. The Sweeney yield 4.84% on the two year uh, yield. The 10 year real yield 2.11%, uh, up a solid 10 basis points. I got to bring it up, Paul. I mean, we're going to get an $80 print on bread crude. Yeah. You know, I mean, we were looking at $69 in yep. West Texas. Yep. Intermediate didn't get there. A little, <coughs> excuse me, lift oil here in the last couple of days. Tom, I, I got to ask Nick this question. Nick, you're at Haverford <laughs> College. You call up your parents and you say you want to major in Near Eastern Archaeology. What did they say to that? They were oddly accommodative. I got to <laughs> give them a lot of credits. They said, do whatever it is you want to do. And I think it's because they knew me well enough to know that that wasn't going to be the right. end point for my career. They knew that ultimately I wanted financial success and I wasn't going to get that as a professor. And so right. they kind of trusted their judgment and they were absolutely right. You know, because it was a great thing to major in. And then Nick barbelled that. I mean, he saved the day by getting his MBA from the University of Chicago. Yeah, so, I mean, that'll do it. Yeah. So, so Nick, <laughs> we're, we're going to walk away from you here right now, but let's get one final question in. Do you suggest in the Near East that Iran will continue with a theocracy or can they find their way back to a more representative government? Oh, police states are very difficult to, uh, to unseat, unfortunately. I think for the people of Iran, they, they're going to have to live with that uh, government for a while longer. On international relations, <laughs> Nick Colas. Thank you so much, Nick. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. I've, I always say this, we protect the copyright of all of our guests. You can get uh, Nick Colas's work at yep. Data Track because I'll get four emails. Can you send me Nick's report? Yeah. Can you send me Nick's? We don't do that. No. We protect the, you know, this is how they get paid. This is how Nick Colas pays them. A lot of, a lot of smart people I know on Wall Street uh, <clears throat> you know, read his stuff religiously. But, but, you know, what's the mortgage rate do after the shock report? I, yeah. I mean, I, I my head's spinning. I, yeah. I mean, still spinning from yesterday's news flow. Right. And this, you, know, you think about this job report here, uh, again, it just kind of goes to the question of this economy, uh, despite all the challenges and all the negative headwinds you hear about there, and, yeah. and maybe some of the rhetoric from just folks out in the marketplace where it's tough out right. there, and it is. But, you know, from a labor perspective, it feels like, and the data seems to s suggest that, you know, if folks want a job, there's but, jobs to be had out there. And if you're looking for some growth in your wages, you know, this is a market where yeah. you can get that. Did you hear what Nick Cola said, though? I think it was early in the interview. We were talking haves and have nots, yeah. and he modeled 20%, 80%. Right. 80% struggling in America. And to go to one of the big shocks of the week, the Modi stunning defeat. I'll use the word, the defeat of Modi as he forms a, 
coalition government in India, all of the experts, including Raghun Rajan, say it was job formation of the have-nots. Why is it any different than India? Yeah, I, 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 I agree. And so it's, you know, we've heard it here before, as we're in they, an election they, year, it's the economy, stupid, and, yeah. and here it is, the haves and have-nots. Raghu Rajan writing 14 pages for Foreign Affairs just in the last couple days, and, and he says, look, here's the fact, Mercedes-Benz has record sales in India. Yeah. I mean, it's the same polarity in India. Yeah. Is we have here, except we don't think we have polarity. No, and uh, you know, yeah. here in the U.S., it was all about the middle class, but it, it just feels like over the last, call it 20, 30 years, that's been well, pressured. That would be a great study to say by yep. Pew Research now or yes. Gallup. I mean, what is the middle class? We'll have to see. What we need to do is get to the next half hour. Paul Sweeney at 10 a.m. on Bitcoin. Oh yeah. On LIBOR, there'll be economic data. There'll be some interesting conversations to say. Uh, the least. We're on YouTube. Subscribe to Bloomberg Podcasts. Search Bloomberg Podcasts. And we say good morning from New York City. Bloomberg Surveillance. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. 
From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo alongside Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney with your opening bell report. So how will the markets react to a blockbuster U.S. jobs report? It showed employers added payrolls of 272,000 last month compared to the 180,000 expected. Uh, the unemployment rate increased from 4% to 3 point, from 2, 2, 4% from 3.9%. Things are just getting started here, so let's get right to the numbers. We'll start with the S&P 500 down two-tenths of a percent, 13 points at 5,000. 1,339. We'll get to the Dow down a tenth of a percent, 66 points at 38,818. And finally, the NASDAQ down two tenths of a percent, 50 points at 17,121. We have to take a look at the bond market. The two-year yield 4.83%, up 11 basis points. We have the 10-year yield 4.40%, and that's up 11 basis points as well. At the open, also want to check in with GameStop. They're now down 19%. Please. That is your Bloomberg Go opening bell report Tom and Paul so what does that mean what is it you know it's down 19 percent from yesterday and it must be down 40 percent from 5 a.m yeah and so the question hysteria. is you know if if you're the bankers here dialing up institutional investors hey I got 75 million shares for sale right. where do you want to buy it so I don't know how that phone call goes joining us now Tiffany Wilding Pimco uh, uh, Tiffany off the Pimco desk in Newport Beach is anybody trading meme stocks <laughs> <laughs> Jerome Schneider? I can just well, see we're Jerome. A bond, we're a bond shop. <laughs> well, you're a bond shop, but maybe, bond. maybe meme stocks are bond-like. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Tiffany Wild, what a jobs report. There's something wrong here. Maybe it's productivity. Maybe it's technology. Maybe it's migration, immigration. What's the something you're thinking about to describe a boom job economy? Yeah, I mean, so I, I do think, you know, obviously I always, always say any one report can be noisy, but this labor market report, I think overall, um, just shows that we, don't, we still have tight conditions uh, in the labor market in the United States. You know, you have wage inflation, which appears stuck around 4%. That's elevated relative to uh, the Fed's 2% inflation goal. And you have jobs that are, you know, they're continuing to be created. You know, now I, I would say that, you know, there's, there's some differences between the, the household survey. There's two surveys underlying the, this report, the household and the establishment survey. But when you kind of look at them all together, I still think um, overall the picture is pretty solid here for the U.S. economy. Tiffany, uh, it's, who's hiring these people? And where are these people coming from? It just seems, I think, if you ask most market participants, they're like, boy, this labor market's strong. And why is it so strong? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think that, you know, obviously the underlying economy is strong as well. Um, and certainly uh, the flow of, uh, you know, the increased flow of, of immigrants, you know, in the immigration numbers that we've seen over the last, you know, year has has been a very big contributor, I think, to not only to growth, uh, obviously, but also but labor, uh, keeping labor markets going. Um, it's created more supply, labor supply. Um, you know, and obviously these people not only are supplying their labor, but they are <coughs> consuming in the U.S. They're living in the U.S. Right. So um, it's just it's boosting overall economic activity. Uh, Tiffany, tell Jerome Schneider GME is halted right now. <laughs> That's an automatic halt, Paul, right? Exactly. It's like, I like think a, so. something's triggered. Yeah. So it's just uh, a, a GME volatility. Halted. So t Tiffany, as we step back here, how do you think our Federal Reserve is going to, you know, take in this data point we got today? And as Tom Keen likes to point out correctly, you know, even if you look at it on a trend basis, still pretty darn solid. How do you think the Fed's looking at the labor market? Yeah, I mean, you know, I certainly think that, you know, maybe there is something for everyone in this report. But overall, you know, our view has been that, um, you know, that, you know, we had sticky inflation in the first quarter, uh, a reacceleration that looks like that's coming back down. But ultimately, the Fed needs more confidence uh, around their inflation forecast and inflation's going back to two. And it's probably going to take them a little bit more time to get that. And the fact that labor markets are continuing to be strong, we're seeing cyclical sectors in the economy, you know, so not just government uh, uh, le uh, healthcare, education, but cyclical sectors reaccelerate a little bit. Uh, and that is, you know, we think that's the, the markings of a pretty strong economy here. They need the economy to cool off, um, you know, and so it's going to take them a little bit longer, we still think, in order to get that confidence. So, you know, our right. view is, has been that there's going to be some significant movement in their projections for uh, the rate path, and we still think that's going to be the case. Tiffany Anna Wong, out of Booth, out of Booth School in Chicago Economics has done terrific work for Bloomberg, and she's looking out months and quarters 
it revisions due to a flawed birth death model. And I want to emphasize, folks, Anna Wong did not predict today to be a soggy jobs report. She decidedly did not say that. But Tiffany, is there validity that maybe we've got the countable jobs in America wrong? Well, so I think if, depending on what, I said there's two surveys that underlie this report. Depending on which survey you look at, the level of unemployment and the increase in, in jobs that we've gotten over the last year is, is very different. The household survey is, you know, more or less flat, uh, where the establishment survey is, is up, I think, over a million. So that's a very big gap. I think that the truth is somewhere in the middle. Uh, you know, data that we get on, um, like early data that we get on potential revisions for the establishment survey suggests they're going to come down. But I think the fact that the household survey doesn't pick up immigration that well and are on a real-time basis suggests that survey right. is probably being underestimated. Okay, so, so there's some. I think there, yeah. overall there's truth is in between. A totally unfair question. I don't want you to get in trouble, but let's go there. On non-farm payrolls, what is the plug-in for immigration at the margin? Is it thirty thousand per month? Is it ten? Is it a hundred thousand? How do you measure that? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that there's there's two key questions here. You know, obviously, one is what is the number of, of folks that are coming into the U.S. economy? Last year, we think it was about three million um, that were uh, asylum seekers in addition to the visa issuances. But however, there are big backlogs to those folks that are to get work permits. Um, you know, so in terms of, of at least legal working, we think about half, just under half of those folks were able to get a, a work permit. You know, so that would suggest, you know, maybe 75 to 100 additional bump per month uh, of, of, of folks that are coming into the labor market to get jobs, you know, over the, you know, the usual trend of, you know, call it 100. So, I, you know, I would say an underlying pace of, of maybe 170 uh, is kind of the neutral rate at this point uh, for the labor markets. Wow, interesting. Tiffany, so if, if, most, if this is a fully employed economy, how does that translate to how the consumer is doing? How do you guys think about the health of the U.S. consumer these days? Yeah, I mean, I, I think overall the consumer is, is doing quite well. You know, certainly different um, income levels are doing better than others. Uh, and you guys were, were kind of talking about this earlier in the program, but, you know, there's definitely increasing evidence that the lower-end consumers are struggling. They are, uh, you know, we're seeing them move or transition from current to 30 or even 60-day delinquencies on their credit cards at higher frequencies. But one interesting thing is, is that, you know, some of them are then transitioning back to current. You know, so we would argue the lower end consumers hanging on right now. The reason why it's hanging on is because the labor markets are so strong. You know, and labor markets are so strong because uh, you know demand in the economy is still there. So, you know, ultimately we think it's you know we're we're still um, you know kind of going here at a pace of of sort of two percent inflation. Things are slowing. Immigrants, um, you know, the Biden administration just put out an executive order, which makes coming into the country much more difficult now. Um, you know, so that impulse will fade, growth will slow, you know, but I guess overall we would say that the domestic consumer here is still doing okay. Tiffany, thank you. Tiffany Wilding with PIMCO there on our strange American economics. Yep. Well, Paul, I go back to what you said. I think you said it Monday coming in off a social weekend. The anecdote is just there. The yep. restaurants are packed. Yep. Like, you can't get in. No, and uh, w but what's interesting is there certainly is a bifurcated um, economy out there. I just read a wonderful piece in the New York Times yesterday about the New Jersey fishing uh, business, uh, commercial fishing business, and it's kind of in, in the problems they're having with fentanyl, uh, actually, in that fleet. Uh, but it talks about some of the folks in that industry, and that's a tough business, and a lot of folks in that industry really down on their luck and are really scratching by and having a hard time dealing with uh, inflation. Um, it's a great piece, really gets into some depth there. And that just highlights for me that there really is, you know, a dual economy out there with the haves and have-nots, and, and apparently, you know, this inflation really, really hitting hard on some of those folks at the lower end from an economic um, employment level. So, you know, when you see average hourly yeah. earnings up 4.1%, yeah. uh, that's higher than the inflation rate, and that's the good news. But for a while there, you know, the reality is prices are higher, and that's hard on a lot of folks. Over for trading. And I, I guess the stock market actually a little better than I thought. The VIX 12.73, down negative 100, SPX negative 17, NASDAQ down two-tenths of a percent. But 
you know, not like the bond market. The bond market's, let me look at the Sweeney yield here. Yeah, move. the two years moving. <laughs> we got yeah. the up about 12 basis Four points. Point, yeah, 12 yeah. basis points. So, yep, you know, bond 84. market's talking more than the stock market right now. With our news in New York City, Michael Biden. Thank you very much, Tom. Paul, Lisa, President Biden apologized to Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky for the delay in military assistance that allowed Russia to make some battlefield gains. The two leaders met in France during a visit to attend ceremonies marking the 80th anniversary of D-Day. I apologize for the uh, those weeks of not knowing what's going to happen in terms of funding <laughs> because uh, we had trouble getting the a bill that we had to pass that had the money in it from some of our very conservative members who were holding it up. President Biden told Zelensky that Americans stand by Ukraine. Federal prosecutors are wrapping up their gun case against Hunter Biden with two more witnesses expected today in their effort to prove to jurors that the president's son lied on a mandatory gun purchase form when he said he wasn't an unlawful user or addicted to drugs. Prosecutors are still planning to call the drug expert and an FBI chemist. Their testimony will cap a week that has been largely dedicated to highlighting the seriousness of Hunter Biden's drug problem through witness testimony. He has pleaded not guilty to three felonies. The Optica Foundation says it will no longer accept money from Huawei Technologies. Bloomberg's Amy Morris explains. Optica made the move more than a month after Bloomberg reported Huawei was the sole funder of the foundation's research competition, which has awarded millions of dollars and attracted hundreds of proposals from scientists all over the world, including at top universities that banned their researchers from working with Huawei. It was a strategy Huawei used to stay ahead of cutting-edge research despite U.S. restrictions. The Optica Foundation will also return all of the money that Huawei donated for 2024 and the previous two years. In Washington, Amy Morris, Bloomberg Radio. Global News, 24 hours a day and whenever you want it. With Bloomberg News Now, I'm Michael Barr, and this is Bloomberg. Tom Paul Lisa. Canadian Grand Prix. Mm. Does anyone care? I, I feel Formula One slipping away. The net, the Netflix thing, you remember, you know, yeah. they did the Netflix thing, and it's just, it's slipping away. I... Okay, I'm, I got to stand up for F1. <laughs> I'm, here I go. I know people said Monaco after lap one was was a boring race. And yes, granted, I did. I, I, <laughs> but I mean, yes, you, you have races like that. You you know, yes, where tire wear is going to come in, and you have to to do all that. That's part of racing. Not not every race is going to be a crash bang smack 'em up kind of of race. <clears throat> and the strategy and the art of the sport. Excuse me. Uh, is is what's important to me, but anyway, but yeah, I'm not gonna lie. It was they had a woodchuck the out. They were doing like pretests, mm -hmm. and they had like a woodchuck <laughs> out <laughs> on the track. It's uh, Montreal. You know. I just watched the movie Ferrari, so now I'm a little bit more into it. Oh, oh into it. yeah, Very good. yeah. They're so. loaded for next year. They're bringing Sir Lewis over from Mercedes yeah. to there with Leclerc, and the big news this week is Mr. Perez of Mexico was re-signed okay. by Red Bull. So, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm psyched it's for good. Canada. Yeah. And again, you yeah, could invest so. in Formula One through <clears throat> Liberty Formula One, public Very traded good. stock. Which brings us to the, come on, folks, let Mario Andretti get his a team in there. They're trying. I hope so. Why, why wouldn't you let Mario Andretti's team? Uh, that's, the, that's a very, that's a great name. very good question. All right. And so, we'll Thank see. You. Our surveillance Indianapolis 500 <laughs> reporter Michael Barr weighs in on Midwest. Uh, auto racing. We weigh in with a data check, negative 25. The tape deteriorates in the last five minutes. The levels here, 38,800 Dow, 5,300 SPX, 18,900, almost up to 19,000 on the NASDAQ 0100. The VIX, you know, 14, 13, 12.60. That's a wow statistic. On a Friday, after the jobs report from New York City, Bloomberg Surveillance.
Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. We have the markets under pressure. This is after a surprise showing of strength in the U.S. Labor Department non-farm payrolls. They advanced 272,000 last month. So we have the Nasdaq down two tenths of a percent at 17,130. We have the Dow down a tenth of a percent, 38,848, and we have the S&P 500 down a tenth of a percent at 5,344. The bond market, the two-year yield, 4.85 percent, and that is down. Oh, just got an alarm here. Uh, that is down about 13 basis points. The yield on the 10-year, 4.4. Two percent, and that is up, that is up 14 points up, not down. Over to the Lyft, kicked off its first investor day yesterday. Said it's expecting a 15 percent growth in bookings over the next three years. Those shares up six percent. They're getting a lift of their own. We have Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing. They're up about two percent, just about. Uh, May sales rose 30 percent thanks to strong demand for AI. Also recovery in some consumer electronics. And shares of ski operator Vail Resorts, they are falling down 11%. That's despite Paul's ski trips yes. down this morning. Missed revenue estimates and is cutting guidance for the full year. And yes, today, Jobs Day, but did you know it's also National Donut Day, which means free donuts at places like Dunkin' and Krispy Kreme. There you go. You're welcome. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Uh, Lisa, thanks so much. Greatly appreciate it. On <laughs> Jobs Day. Uh, and they're down negative 48 now. It's just, just sort of like a Friday feel to it. Paul's going to keep yep. it exciting after 10 o'clock. Jeffrey Cleveland joins right now, chief economist Peyton and Rigel in Good Los morning. Angeles and, and joins again with a different view that is valued, valued, uh, valued. You're, you're out on a left coast, Jeffrey Cleveland. It's an extraordinarily different economy. When you see a surprise boom jobs report, are you surprised? I'm not surprised. I think this is consistent with uh, the other data we've been seeing the last couple of years. The economy remains strong. If you focus just on California, you could look at the unemployment rate here. It touched around 4%, Tom, in summer of 22, and we're now up to 5.3% on the California unemployment rate as of the latest reading in April. So we, we have seen a rising unemployment rate here could be due to some of the, the tech sector weakness. Um, that's definitely one culprit that maybe California has suffered more directly from than the, than the nationwide figures. But I think the nationwide economy is, is solid, 272,000 on payrolls. You can't complain too much about that. Jeffrey, is this, um, is this labor number and the trend we see in the labor, the consistent trend we see in labor, has that removed any rate cuts from 2024, do you think? Uh, so we only have one in our call at the end of the year in December. So that, that's all we have. I know there's others out there touting multiple rate cuts. I think the reaction in two-year yields this morning tells you uh, the, the bond market is disappointed and it's rethinking uh, the probability of rate cuts. It's pushing, it's pushing them out. I think it's entirely plausible. We'll go through the whole year without getting rate cuts. I mean, when you have 272,000 jobs added, you're near all-time highs on equities. Inflation is still a problem. Right. Uh, what, what, what's the case for a rate cut here, in my, in my view? The bond bulls that I talk to, they tell me, well, we have a, we're, a slowdown is underway in the economy. I, I don't see that in payrolls. We definitely see that in labor demand. You, you see that with the jolts data earlier in the week. Yeah, Job but where are you on GDP? Down. I mean, the heart of the matter in the CPI next week in the Fed meeting is Atlanta GDP, GDP now is cratered from four-ish. Nobody believed it. Down cratered. to under two-ish. Are, are you modeling a sub-2% real GDP? I'm objecting to the use of the word cratered. We, we were running way hot, 4%. Now, you know, we're, we're 2%. We're using 2%. We think that's a reasonable guess for the quarter. I think that's a reasonable guess for the year. Q4 to Q4, I think we could top 2% uh, this year. So that, that's where we're at. We, we got the unemployment rate at uh, below 4% at year end. So with that backdrop, it's hard to really have rate cuts in your forecast. So, How about the consumer, that? Jeffrey? Uh, you know, a lot of talk and a lot of evidence suggesting that there's really kind of two consumers out there, if not more, and, and the, the lower end, it's probably more of them than we think out there, and they're struggling with this inflation data. What's your view of the consumer? 
Uh, de the, the claims of the death of the U.S. Co consumer has been greatly exaggerated once again. That, that's, uh, that's the one-line response. I mean, we've been hearing about consumer weakness for a while. Consumer spending is, is still holding up quite well. I'm actually you know, pretty impressed with how it's, it's held up. Um, I think you have to look at income, which, which still is growing. Some of the lower income cohorts are, are still seeing income gains. As inflation has come down, those are real income gains, so that's good. Uh, but uh, I think you also have to think about the consumer in terms of their debt obligations. So, you know, we like to look at financial obligation ratios for households. Uh, those look very manageable relative to history. Um, so we, we haven't seen a big rise in, in debt um, obligation ratio. So that's good. People's asset values have gone up. So that that helps. Um, I still think people have savings, so that could help as well. Right. So on all those fronts, I think the consumer is still in, in pretty good shape. In, Paul, in I just look quickly at three stocks. I'm not going to mention their names, but they're part of the Magnificent Seven. All three stocks basically are on the bid, a little bit with green on the screen, mm -hmm. off of bonds going back up in yield, and the stock market, the Dow's to fractionally down negative 52. I, I'm, I'm sorry. There's... There's an effort, John Riding of Breen would say there's an ambiguity here. You can have some tensions in the economy and still prosper. Yep. And that's what the tape is telling me right now. I think now. it was. I mean, we were, uh, futures looked really weak uh, kind of going into the market here. Now we've got the S&P down only four points. So uh, as a lot of folks are saying, this is a market that wants to go up. Uh, Jeffrey, how do you think about the U.S. economy vis-a-vis -vis some of our big, big partners in, in Europe? in Asia, particularly China, it just feels like the U.S. economy, we've heard the term economic exceptionalism. Um, is that kind of in line with what you're looking at? Yeah, I mean, you look at the U.S. compared to major peers since 2019, U.S. real GDP growth has outpaced virtually all of them, uh, with the exception of Aust Australia. I think Australia's outpaced the U.S., so kudos to them. Uh, <laughs> so the U.S. looks strong. The, the big question a lot of clients and uh, internal colleagues asking this week is, well, you know, the Bank of England, or sorry, the, the ECB has cut sure. rates. The Bank of Canada has cut rates. Is the Fed next? And we've just been saying, you know, th those uh, central banks can go their own way. Um, I think, you know, the, the argument that the U.S. economy is much stronger is sound, and, and the, the case for rate cuts here is much less compelling in our opinion, so that's fine. I think also the argument that there's going to be a string of rate cuts by some of these other global central banks might be premature as well. Right. We have our chart of the week out this week. You could dial that up on the socials, and we're just looking at underlying global core inflation. Uh, it's still above the pre-COVID trend right. uh, globally. So I think that's still something right. that people need to consider. Great brief. Jeffrey Cleveland, yep. thank you for wrapping up our jobs report in this 9 o'clock hour at Wall Street time. That's not a small matter. The, Fed, the ECB cut the interest rate yeah. as their inflation forecast went up. Yeah, a lot of I that's mean, not a small matter. No, that's that's not like it. original. Yeah, exactly. Typically, you <clears throat> like the you know they cut into what they think is a, uh, declining inflation right. there, but um, they made a promise, right. you know. And a lot of bond traders I've talked to said, you know, right. they made a promise and they want this be uh, keep that I promise mean, to the marketplace. I mean, I've been sort of numb today. Sweeney's got me through the the show today, folks, because yesterday the news flow yeah was was extraordinary. Exactly. I, I mean, this was a breath of fresh air just having a jobs. Uh, report. Of course, our global technical director, Steve Gonzalez, and yeah, uh, you know, okay. he's been, you know, you know, he's, he's in charge of, of the songs and Good. all that. Our intern is Bennett Malo. Okay, he's done a great job here, sitting in, sitting in. Good. You know, we're not, we're not, we're not sure he can sit up yet. Uh, we're not no, sure he's in the calling. Well, stage that was because of the Thursday night. You yeah, know, you go out on Thursday if you're an intern, you're out on Thursday night until. <laughs> I mean, you're up all night. I mean, till two, 2 a.m. or <laughs> that. But it's, it's been it's been interesting to say the uh, the least. They got a lot of comments on yesterday's broadcast. Thank you for the comments on our coverage of uh, the English Channel. Yeah. And all there from Portsmouth on over. And to, around uh, uh, at 10 a.m., President Biden is scheduled <clears throat> to speak at Normandy, uh, and when he does that, we will bring that to you, Tom, with a sign. It, it's more. It is a symbol of the Rangers who so many sacrificed going up a cliff. At Normandy, it was a singular remember, battle. It, you know, a ranger. There's nothing a ranger feels that he or she can't get over, or can't climb. So, I, you, but I can't imagine being the person that ordered them to do it. I mean, order them well, to go scale it against those defenses. Yeah. Uh, just the decisions yeah, that had to be made were made. Have a good weekend. We're all New Jersey on our music today. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Springsteen. John, good morning. <laughs>